and welcome to another episode of Red Thread Podcast. I'm your host, Randy, and today I've got Ari Asulin here in studio to uh, discuss a little Saturnian uh, cosmology and uh, and then some, man. I'm super excited to have you. Thanks for coming on. Absolutely. Uh, nice to be on here. Thank you. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll just jump right in. Yeah, and, it's yeah, a huge any... topic. So right. yeah, um, yeah I for, mean... the un- for the uninitiated, Saturnian cosmology is basically another theory of cosmology out there. Um, the ones that we have already, of course, um, uh, <clears throat> uniformitarianism, which is a theory that the universe uh, forms very gradually over billions of years. It also involves a big bang at the beginning and a lot of other things sort of in a bucket of belief that can't be tested or proven, but represents the cosmology that's taught in schools, right? NASA covers it. And uh, a lot of people actually don't realize that um, uniformitarianism started with the Vatican in the 18th century. It was the uh, it was uh, Swedenborg who basically came up with the whole thing. And, uh, and since then, it's been taught sort of as a secular science. But, you know, there is no secular science when it comes to the Big Bang. That is a belief that something created this entire universe. So that's a cosmology we're all familiar with, right? Here's another one, uh, bi- uh, uh, creationism, right? That's cosmology, uh, that the universe was created by God in six days and then he rests. Um, you know, a lot of people have trouble fo- swallowing this one because it sort of sounds like a fairy tale. You also have to believe in sort of an omnipotent creator God of the universe that also meddles in human affairs to such a degree that he's willing to like, you know, kill everyone off and start over, wipe everyone out, start over, you know, flood, start over. And it's just like, uh, okay, that's a cosmology. Maybe that's how we got here. And then Saturnian cosmology represents an alternate to all that, completely different hypothetical that the ancestors were not spinning fairy tales or trying to, you know, uh, by their way into aristocracy, they're actually just telling the truth. They've written down what they saw happen right. in the sky on the earth. And this is every indigenous race on the planet. It's not just, you know, the, the Germans or the French or the, uh, the Americans, but everyone, everyone, including the Africans, uh, saw all these events because if you're on earth and you see them because they're in close proximity to the earth and they're sort of, they, ma- they matter a lot. Um, they might affect you. There might be a fire coming down, destroying your village. There might be another flood. There might be um, darkness and all the crops will stop growing. Right. All of these things happen in cataclysmic times. And back then, nobody knew what to make of it. And now people pretty, pretty much still don't know what to make of it. They still argue over what all of our history means. Right. So, all the different tales from the different, uh, yeah. you know, pasts of different uh, uh, different ancient cultures, uh, how they, they do kind of line up, um, even have symbolism, um, yep. cave art drawings that are, are similar around the world. Uh, yeah. things that are supposedly referring to the galactic center and you know certain constellations and and these things all line up all around the world so right you know to think that they're gonna be like our current system and <laughs> deny the future the truth uh suggests that you know maybe they did write down what they were seeing and what they were interacting with so yeah definitely and and so it's really simple saturnian cosmology says if we're to assume that all of these testimonies are real are true, then here is what we think they were seeing. Uh, what, what does Saturnian add to this? Well, it adds um, in the 90s, they uh, were introducing plasma physics. Everyone is inventing mm. plasma physics. They finally saw it in the universe, reproducing it in the lab for the first time. And um, <clears throat> this fit in right well with Velikovsky's theories that, um, that all these you know gods of the past were actually planets in close cataclysm with the Earth. But the first problem to solve is how, to, how do planets get close to each other and have cataclysm? We don't observe that today. We don't even observe that in other solar systems right now. So if that the case, what physics explains it? It's not Newtonian physics, not gravity. We know that that would not result in cataclysm. It results in slow and go uh, accretion uh, over billions of years, not, not, sudden, not, not what they're saying, mountains forming and the sky splitting open, not those kind of things, not by Newtonian physics right. and not by, not by relativistic physics either. Uh, which was very popular in the mid uh, 20th century, which um, is, it, that was a spin. If you really ask me, relativistic physics does not define anything very well and sort of says Newtonian isn't correct. We don't know for sure, but here's a bunch of, you know, hypothetical equations like e equals MC square. Um, and we're supposed to sort of derive physics out of that. That's called relativistic physics. And that's the modern physics of today. The one that's sort of underneath that, that's sort of been operating this whole time behind the scenes is quantum physics. And that, right. of course, has been around since the 20th century. And quantum physics, um, 
we, we explain things completely differently than relativistic or Newtonian. We're not talking about particles anymore, We're talking about waves and energy. And um, in, in quantum energy, the quantum state is where if you add a whole bunch of energy in a point, um, it will flow to another point and create a quantum state between those two points. Quantum means happening at the exact same location right. at the same time. Right, it's a paradox. spooky action at a, at a distance, exactly. I think Einstein right. called it. <laughs> I mean, come on, let's, exactly. you know, for, for them, and that's just them demonizing energy mm -hmm. right out of the gate. Oh, that's just spooky, right? You got that's it. yes, just exactly. spooky action, man. Right. <laughs> and today you got a lot of quantum physics physicists basically, you know, slashing at, at relativistic Newtonian saying, hey, concepts like uh, non-local, um, uh, whatever they call it, is not real because quantum physics are the underlying physics of everything. That's what they keep insisting today. It, they mm. would have, if they would have said that during Einstein's times, then it would have, he would have been sort of explained away quickly. And in fact, there is a book that came out during his, uh, during his fame time that was, uh, said 100 uh, scientists against Einstein. He's 100 scientists wrote this one book saying, here's why he's wrong, don't listen to them. So we could see a suppression of science going on here. And this science demonstrates not just like, you know, how do we run cars and stuff, electricity, but mm. how did the universe form? How did the solar system form? All of it, it ties into a sort of suppressed quantum science that has never made the main stage. So in Saturnian cosmology, we, everything is electric. We, we deal with the electric universe, like you said. Um, mm -hmm. It's a it's the theory, electric universe theory goes that um, all um, interaction in the universe is electric in nature, that gravity is actually a subset of electromagnetism, that gravity does not um, pull atoms together. It's actually layers of electromagnetism, which, which differs, goes negative to positive and back. And what you have are planets that are positively charged on the outside, negatively on the inside, and they're interacting with other positively charged planets in our solar system in a positive sun environment. Essentially, what happens is these planets will build up charge, um, draw towards each other, and then discharge that energy and draw away from each other over right. and over. Almost all of the cataclysm since the very first memory, since the golden age, can be explained by just this physics alone, this, this repulsive and attractive electromagnetic um, physics, the, the basis of electric universe. Um, so let's start at the beginning. Um, I might as well share a screen here. Uh, oh, I got that disabled. If you want to try to enable sharing the screen, then I can do that. Otherwise, oh, yeah, for sure. I'll just keep, uh, get the timeline here. There we go. Right. So a lot of this stuff wasn't very convincing to me until I sort of saw some of these pictures from yeah, David no Talbot in the 90s. And uh, David Talbot is the guy who basically made a, um, a video um, demonstrating, uh, sorry, CGI, some of these events, how they might have looked. And uh, let's try that share now. Boom, it works. There we go, right here, here. And so we see these images, awesome. right? Um, you got this huge planet in the sky. You also, right. also got this uh, eight star figure, or maybe six or th three star, or a pointed star. And then in front of it, you got this red circle, Mars. And it's like, whoa, when did this ever happen? You know, why would this happen? And so what this is, is the collinear configuration of planets. During the, the Saturnian Golden Age, which is the first memory that we have on this planet, there was such a collinear configuration of planets that basically we were in the middle. If you looked up in the North Pole, you'd see Mars. And behind it, you see Venus, which is plasma. It's not a rock. And Venus takes various shapes, connecting energy between Saturn and Mars. And behind Venus, you see the huge gas giant Saturn with no rings yet. Behind Saturn is actually Jupiter, and you can't see it yet because um, it's hidden behind Saturn. They're about the same size gas giants. Right. And then behind Jupiter is the sun, which again, you cannot see, but um, the, the light from the sun is visible during the daytime and still rotates. And at the nighttime, it basically gets darker. Although at, during nighttime, you still see the collinear configuration in the sky. It's just that's tilted away from the sun, making it a little bit darker. So um, oh. let's, uh, yeah, let's uh, grab this movie here. Um, this is one that I was putting together. And in the middle of it, um, I showed the demonstration. Yeah, right here. Come on, YouTube, go for it. <laughs> okay. um, I don't think that's going to get any bigger, but. Oh, it's it's fine. But uh, essentially, for for the audio listeners, it'll be up on Odyssey. It'll be on uh, our uh, YouTube as yeah. well, so you can go so take a look over there. Yeah, definitely go to, go to uh, uh, ParadigmThreat.net to see this video. Basically, it's the 
uh, the David Talbot video demonstrating what the Saturnian mm. cosmology theory believes happened in the Golden Age. You had this, this about 700-year period of, of perfect Golden Age when nothing went wrong. And then towards the end of it, you started to have instability and cataclysm. We just saw in the video is Mars, planet Mars, stretching all the way down to Earth, forming an elongated column of debris, striking the planet Earth, and then hitting it with you know fire, debris, um, oh, sorry, um, What's the, what's the word? Um, brimstone, the, the kind of uh, right. So all of all of the devastations that are spoke about in all these ancient uh, legends and myths are right. are essentially explained by the physics of this uh, this concept. Right. And why does Mars have so much burning rock in it? The brimstone is basically phosphorus. Um, <clears throat> it, it's because um, Mars, in, in its position in the collinear configuration, endured a great deal more energy um, on it than the Earth did. Earth is much bigger, has a lot of water. Mars is just a big rock and it got, it got sort of fried during the golden age. You can see it today. You can just look at Mars and you can see that entire surface of it has scars across. Right. This is not from any kind of ancient ocean or anything like that. These are lightning scars that occurred rapidly and over a very long time. So these lightning scars also turned, uh, let me pause the video there. Lightning scars also uh, uh, converted the material of Mars over into its reddish form, sort of through alchemy. Very high energies converted the rock from one to the other and created this phosphorus. And that's where you get the red shape and the burning rock from. Right. Um, so, so that's anyway. why it's it's got this oxidized look because it's like hyper oxidized by the electrical Absolutely. current. Absolutely. You got it. Right on. And so uh, during that golden age, it basically had these oscillations. Mars goes back and forth. But then the golden age ends uh, cataclysmically. It, it ends with the entire collinear configuration breaking up. The plants themselves individually got too uh, heavy, too much charge, too much uh, mass. And they they start oscillating in instability. They had too much. Um, they weren't going to form a a junction of energy anymore, but spiraling um, energies that formed their own electromagnetic fields per planet, and that essentially caused the breaking up of the collinear configuration. Um, like this video shows, it sort of happened um, all at once. Big cataclysm, darkness. Um, we saw the sun for the first time, but then Jupiter covered up the sun right away. As we got caught in Jupiter's orbit, Jupiter now being the biggest gas giant around, Saturn retreating back to the outer solar system. Now, now we're past uh, a lot of the uh, the old myths like uh, Saturn called um, Kronos and Kronos right. in the, right. and, eats know, his children. Right. Kronos eats his children and then spits all the children out, defeated by its own child Zeus or or uh, or the Greek version of Zeus. Can't remember right now. And then all the children are freed. Right. So that's freeing of all the planets in mythology, basically. The breaking up of the collinear configuration. Now we're in the nonlinear configuration. This is Jupiter-dominated um, uh, solar system. Mm -hmm. That's uh, sorry, not uh, orbit. I should say orbit around Jupiter. That's also together orbiting the Sun. This means that we see Venus, Mars, Jupiter uh, in close proximity to the Earth, and all this kind of cataclysm occurring over and over. What we have here is the King Arthur story and many, many others. Moses' story, uh, but it's particularly King Arthur because that's where you get the Round Table. Let me go back in the video a little bit here. They sort of see that um, after the breaking up of the collinear configuration, the, um, the planets start to rotate around each other and around Jupiter. So Jupiter is King Arthur, the biggest, you know, the king uh, on the throne. The throne is made of a of a um, of a uh, corona trail um, flowing outside of the southern uh, hemisphere of, of Jupiter at the time. Uh, so it looked like a big uh, ball on a throne, a big fiery ball. So that's Moses on the mountain, burning bush, but also King Arthur. And King Arthur didn't sit on the top of the, uh, the table, right? He sat at a round table. So uh, we have a round configuration where all the planets are equal. We also have Mars and Venus, like I said, which represent mm. uh, Guinevere and Lancelot. Uh, Mars was the biggest knight around. No one could ever challenge him because there were no other planets like it around. In our solar system, Mars is the biggest, hottest rock um, compared to Mercury. We'll get into that later. Um, so King Arthur myth during the Dark Ages when... Uh, when there was little darkness, when plants wouldn't grow, when um, people had trouble giving, you know, having kids and giving birth, all kinds of problems like that, and they're looking for sort of a savior. At some point, Jupiter um, shows up again and um, and sort of stabilizes the solar system. Uh, let me get to that part in the timeline here. Right. So the uh, golden age ends violently. We get this huge great deluge. That's when all the plants pass through the outer sheath of Saturn. It's a, it's a big L-type brown dwarf. It's full of plasma layers, and mm -hmm. the plants plas pass through one of those plasma layers. The plasma cools into water. It's actually salt water, 
and crashes into the earth. We got this huge, great deluge event. It actually occurs three times. The first one was the worst one. And this is where we get our oceans. Oceans have salt water, right? Um, we don't know where the salt comes from in our earth oceans. We have never found a source for it. You know, like one part of the, the ocean is very salty or something. No, nothing. Mm -hmm. But the earth saltwater oceans do match up perfectly with the saltwater found in Saturn's rings today. Perfect ratio of salt to hydrogen. So, you know, correlations there. So uh, we got the Kronos devouring children. That was Saturn, right? Eating the planets and Zeus intervenes. Um, the cosmic thunderbolt. We see this all over the place. Um, it, we see it in Poseidon. Right. That's um, the symbol I was thinking of in cave art, uh, where it looks like a man with his arms and legs spread out, and then two oh, orbs, yeah. generally two orbs underneath his arms, signifying right. a plasma event. And this is a, exactly uh, what I mean. If <laughs> look at the, the proximity, you know, uh, I don't even know how to, I'm mind blown. The trident, right? You know, you've got, right, your yeah, trident, exactly. you've got the <clears throat> same symbol popping up. This symbol is very important because it, it was the electric discharge between planets would appear in these shapes. And it, it was these right here, shapes. these in the middle are, are the demonstrations of actual plasma events that have been created in labs. Is that correct? Correct. And you're comparing wow. the lab ones to the, to the archetype ones in stone. In wow. That's they're spot on too. That's amazing. Right. It's, it's a direct match. Um, yeah, I got um, <clears throat> the planets represented in literature, you know, um, if you look at the, the uh, CS Lewis, he's all about the planets. Every book represented a planet. And Christianity had a lot to do with monotheism back in the day. Oh, sorry, polytheism. I'm sorry, polytheism. Christianity, the roots of Christianity, they were all aware of all the planet gods, and they had a place for each one and, and you know, ceremonies and everything. So C.S. Lewis remembers old Christianity the way it was. We also had this pyramid empire around the world. Um, we remember only the Egyptian pyramids. Actually, the Egyptian pyramids are small compared to the other ones found, say, in Iraq, Mesopotamia, um, in America. And what we have is the pyramids built around the hemisphere, the, the, um, the equatorial, no, sorry, neither mm -hmm. hemisphere, the equatorial regions of the earth around the desert hot regions. Why would they build pyramids there? It's actually impossible to build them in the desert. It's just too hot, not enough resources, no water to make concrete. Um, well, the, the, the obvious answer to that is back when they built these pyramids, the earth wasn't hot yet. It wasn't in its own orbit, didn't have its own electromagnetic fields and seasons. And it was subjected entirely to the, to the, um, <clears throat> the nonlinear configuration cataclysmic age. And what I believe happened was they realized during that age, during about 2,000 years of darkness, that the energy that was, that was no longer visible was still available on the Earth. These ley lines of electromagnetic energy crossed at certain regions. And on those regions, if you're a, if you're a a seer, you can actually feel them and see them. It wasn't hard to locate. It, you can also use instruments. If you built a structure on these regions, you harness that energy. Right. These pyramids clearly struck, uh, harnessed energy from those regions in those times, and they clearly no longer work or function today. So what were these pyramids? What, what kind of function do you get out of this? Right. And by the way, this is not something that, um, let me skip ahead here. It's not something that went away. We still have pyramids today, like uh, Rugyang Hotel in uh, in North Korea, it's the biggest pyramid on Earth today. It's completely yeah, empty. and it's, it's supposedly it's abandoned. Yeah, abandoned. So, since, so since I mean, built. that's mind blowing in itself. But yeah, I see exactly what right. you're saying. I so mean, you've got yeah, that Tower of Babel looking spire in uh, right. Dubai, right? In Dubai, it looks right? Like the Tower of Babel for sure. No one knows who's in charge of all these places. These people, you know? <laughs> right. It, it, it's a big mystery. So I'm just saying, the Pyramid of Empire never went away. It's, I believe it's still there, very much today. They're trying to to reharness those energies. So what do they do? The pyramids allowed for uh, communication between them. You know, it's very, um, very significant because mm -hmm. uh, uh, the energy that, that hit the center of the pyramids could manifest in different ways. You've built a big iron idol, like a big, uh, you know, dog or something head. Um, you go up to another pyramid and you, and you chant in it. And, and, and then this dog head in this pyramid appears to speak to the slaves. This in the Egyptian empire was their trick to get the slaves to believe that the priests represent God and that their slavery and all that stuff is part of God's wishes plan. And right. if they have any doubts, go into the temple and you'll see that the gods actually speak. The giant idols speak to you. Um, maybe hear it in your head. Maybe hear it. Maybe you can actually hear it. Right. Um, this is all, um, this is all sound energy tricks that uh, it can still be very much produced today. You know, I mean, look um, at us talking to each other right now. Exactly. Um, <laughs> you know, like if, if that doesn't convince people that this could have been possible, you know, at another time, uh, I don't know what will, but I, right. I mean, it's, it's only taken us what a uh, hundred years from like the time of, uh, 
just basic electronics to get to where we are today. So to think that that may not Seems have happened in the past. Yeah. I mean, exactly. that's, that's exactly. crazy. It wouldn't have taken that long, really. Right. So basically, this is a simple trick to get people to believe in gods, but simulating gods in temples, um, energetically, the deep state. Um, have you have you defined who the deep state is in your uh, any of your podcasts? Oh, uh, I mean, not too much. I mean, it's it's just the man. It's a colloquial term. It's sort of yeah, it's sort know? of come up lately because everyone's sort of seen them um, you know, rear their head in, in world history and in modern times too. And they're like, who are these people? You know, they run all world governments. They the, run all the, the religion, they, money, yeah, the, technology. The they, they right? that we all speak of. Yeah, so, that's. <laughs> so yes, you know, they, they aren't like a different race or anything of humans, and um, they're here on Earth and other places where we think humans can't live, like inside Earth and inside Mars. But that's not the point. The point is how they wield so much power. So we're looking at these this evidence in ancient times that they wielded power by playing God, by using suppressed technology, building these giant pyramids for various functions. They're able to enslave a lot of people. Um, <clears throat> what happened was... Um, well, let's skip the other myths and go to the Exodus. What happened was pyramid empire fell apart. The Exodus happened. The Bible mm -hmm. sort of rewrites the story in a very biased way, saying that it's all about the Israelites, um, an uncertain, not a poorly defined race of people who have no reference in real literature, if you really if you look into it. And I'm, I'm born and raised Jewish, so I've been saying this stuff my whole life. And what really happened in the Exodus was that we have an Africa story. Uh, all of Africa experienced it. They're all enslaved by this empire. And in 1492 BC, interesting date, right? 1492, mm -hmm. the um, Jupiter in the sky, which was at the time the god Osiris, uh, made up of three parts, um, fell apart into three parts. The myth goes Osiris was killed by Set and body buried into in the Nile or in underworld. Um, mm -hmm. This was Jupiter spitting out Venus, which it had consumed for hundreds of years inside it, inside it finally spit out on this date it streaked across the sky it was called the angel of death and it proved to the slaves that the priest a did not see it coming had no idea this was going to happen b do not know anything about god they got all wrong they thought it was creator of the universe and actually we just witnessed it fall apart and c that they were obviously emancipated they were no longer required to follow all those old um babylonian custom customs like uh circumcision, taxation, usury, um, baptism, all of it. Uh, they just, they dropped it like a pile of bricks and they exodus from um, the pyramidal empire. Um, but why is it not remembered that the slaves were anything more than the Israelites? There had to have been more slaves than that in Africa, right? Rather than the people that went to Europe later. Um, the answer right. is because the Israelites, unfortunately, were the slave masters, not the slaves. And I'm not the first one to say this. Uh, Sigmund Freud famously said this in 1920. He said, you know, I, I looked into it and there's no way that the Israelites were the slaves. They must have been the masters. Their traditions and, and religion are identical to Egyptian uh, religion. Um, their, everything is, is merged with Egyptian. So um, many people have said it, and I'm saying it again. The, um, the monotheist priests were the ones who left the temples because nobody believed in their God anymore. And yeah, they took their, their religion to Europe as many loyal slaves as they could, ancient artifacts like the Ark of the Covenant, which is apparently a, a, another teleportation device, something that you can communicate through. And they left the pyramid sort of empty. Um, the slaves of Egypt never actually did exodus from those regions. They stayed there because they're used to working out in the heat, and they continued to maintain those pyramids until modern times, actually, until uh, Napoleon times. Um, and they were black slaves. They're all black in Egypt. Um, it wasn't until after the Napoleonic Wars that they all moved out of there and replaced by new people. Um, I know several Egyptians who have told me point blank that they know that that, that is the case in their history. The current Egyptians live there, have all come the 19th century. Let's move up ahead a little bit. Um, later on, um, Venus uh, finds its final orbit close to the sun. We all know that it's near the sun now. But first, it streaked towards the sun in this dramatic fashion. It was remembered as the dragon in Asia. Mm. And in a lot of these pictures, you'll see that the... the Dragon is sort of regarding this, this element that looks like a sun in the sky. It's like, whoa, the dragon stops in its tracks. Um, right, so what's happening? No <laughs> uh, well, well, it's very simple. Uh, Venus went, uh, went from the state it was in, which was our current orbit with Jupiter. And when I say state, I'm referring to the same thing in atomic uh, states where, um, where uh, electrons jump from one level to another. Plants do the same thing. 
and Venus jumped from that outer state to an inner state, having uh, charged so much energy. Right. And dur during that moment, when it reached that state, it stopped. It reached that you know, orbit and just froze. And everyone's like, whoa, the dragon is calmed or, or the, uh, the raging goddess as, as uh, in, in Greek and Roman mythology, the raging, raging goddess has been calmed. Um, so anyway, um, just found its final orbit and it stopped there and, and, and formed a circle shape and stays in that orbit till today. Um, one final thing that happened, the final cataclysm was with planet Mars. As I said earlier, Mars oscillated between Earth and, um, and Saturn and Venus in the golden mm -hmm. age in the, in the nonlinear configuration, Mars also lost between earth and itself. It just it sort of went close and far, um, until after it, it, it did this nine times until and finally in the ninth one, it broke away from earth enough to form its own final orbit. This is regarded many times in many mythologies, but mostly in the, uh, in the Greek mythology of Prometheus, uh, Prometheus of course is regarded heavily in, you know, I mean, even in modern days, a lot of people refer to Prometheus, the uh, god that that gave technology or fire to humans. Right. Yes, this this actually happens. Um, what originally was the god of technology was Zeus. He had the thunderbolt, and he would destroy anyone who tried to build a city or anything. He was essentially telling us that he was forbidding us to use this um, cosmic thunderbolt of the gods. And then Prometheus shows up, and and provides this technology directly to humans. How does it do this? Inadvertently, by by having nine close encounters with Earth, every time it hit um, Earth, it discharged a lot of this energy, and then went back out again. That energy hit the Earth in the form of electricity, massive electrical discharges, the kind that are sort of um, able to vaporize entire cities. Right, so the they, kind that would create something like the Grand Canyon. Exactly, you got it. Right. Um, the uh, <clears throat> so the humans had no choice but to sort of build structures that could harness this energy. And the way we have is cathedrals all over the earth. Nice. Cathedrals have the yeah. word cathode in them. Cathodes are receiving nodes of energy. If you build a cathedral a certain way, then it will absorb those lightning strikes at the top, at the at the pyres, at the spears, and um, and those spears will will charge up and they'll explode. But inside, you'll be safe. You'll be able to survive the storm. So they understood right away. They built cathedrals all over the earth to to survive the Prometheus events. Wow. And by the end of this event, when Mars left, there would be no more cataclysm. There'd be no more events. So human race is sort of left with sort of a now what, you know? And the now what was, we just learned all this technology. We just learned everything we need now. We, we don't need, you know, to worship gods anymore. We don't need to, to charge money anymore. And what we have is in the first moments of, of civilization, that year 686 BC and afterwards, this is a dawn of modern civilization. Humans mm. spread all over the earth. They build all these magnificent cities. Cities in Spain, in France, had electricity back in those days. You see those references also in um, in literature, like Spanish literature does reference that they had electricity in, in the temples, uh, even though they don't understand how that could be. They don't see any nodes, they don't see any plugs, no batteries. Well, wires and batteries are modern technology. Back then they used water. They used stone, like red brick. All of these uh, substances can also hold energy and you could, you could send it through the river because you can collect it in red brick from the sun today right. you can do that if you wanted to right now you build a red brick house plug two nodes on either side of the house and generate electricity during the day so they figured all this out a long time ago like i said prometheus event and and for the first hundred years you basically had um you know a perfect sort of coming out of civilization uh what happened after that was you had your first war the crusades and I can skip ahead to that unless you have any other questions about Saturnian cosmology or. No, man, it's it's awesome. And and again, if there's anyone out there that wants to dig into this a little further, go ahead and go look at paradigmthreat.net. It's all there. I mean, everything <laughs> is yeah, on that site, dude. All of all of the rabbit holes I thoroughly love going down can be found right there. Yeah. And if you know of any others, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Let's get to this timeline here. So um, yeah, this is a script I'm writing. I'm going to make a movie about the mud flood event. I'll get nice. to that. Um, this is uh, what I believe caused it. After doing all this research, after finding Fomenko's new chronology and all this stuff about the phantom time hypothesis, mm -hmm. I basically realized that nobody has explained the mud flood yet. Nobody knows how it happened. Hypothesis, you know, are all, all, all out there, like, you know, aliens and so forth. And, you know, the truth might be somewhere in the middle, but the truth can be achievable, you know, it can 
It can be, we can determine why it happened geopolitically. We don't have to guess at hypotheticals like time travel and, and uh, dimension um, Mandela effect Yeah, stuff. manipulation and all right. that, yeah. We don't right have to on. go into those conclusions. We have all the, the dates and the facts right here. We just need to put it together. So, um, uh, <clears throat> so the phantom time hypothesis, that's the most interesting one, honestly. I didn't expect to find that. I was going to make a video about the last 2,000 years of human history, and then I realized there isn't 2,000, it's only 1,000. Phantom time hypo hypothesis basically states that um, historians in the last five centuries were in a position to basically falsify the timeline. Um, they did this for geopolitical reasons, uh, to mm -hmm. convert people over indigenous tribes, to win wars, to hide their own um, crimes. Hiding their own crimes is the biggest one, actually. Pushing their crimes centuries into the past made right, it look yeah, like they, they didn't do it. You know? Yep. Some statute like, of limitations runs out on things after a thousand exactly. years, right? <laughs> example, exactly. <Biggest> example. <laughs> that makes perfect sense. <laughs> right. About a thousand years, right? The perfect example is the Crusades. You got this event that's supposed to have happened in your, you know, first century, and they got this crusade revenge in the 11th and 12th century. It's like, whoa, they waited a thousand years to do the crusades. That doesn't make sense. But um, from Yanko's new chronology, which is based on Russian history, their literature, stuff found in the Kremlin, and the Kremlin turns out to be very important in our history. Um, these guys uh, explain very rationally that when the Romanov family left Russia, when they, 1775, the whole empire fell apart and they left Russia to, to the, um, Europe and America. They took all that Eastern history with them. They stole it and redacted it and said, that didn't happen in the East, didn't happen in Siberia. There is no such place as Tataria, Rus Horde Empire. That, that, all of that happened in Italy, in the Roman Empire, and uh, you know, in places in Europe. And so by falsifying history, they created a series of contradictions. Uh, history as it's written today doesn't make any sense telling me that the Roman Empire started in Rome from the Etruscans. Okay, uh, well, how'd they create Latin? That's a huge advanced language that nobody else had any part of. And boom, out of nowhere, this tribe creates Latin and it creates an entire world empire. And then within about 40 years, it loses it. In Italy, I don't know. If you look at Italy, take a look at the map, there's no room for an empire. There's no evidence of an empire. There's not that many cities, towns, or castles. The Colosseum seems to be for music and not gladiators. There's no evidence that Anyone ever fought and died in those? And Italy uh, has this magnificent capital, Florence, which is completely ignored today by historians and it's treated like some kind of crime syndicate. If you watch that movie Hannibal, yeah, a bunch of crime. <laughs> right, um, right. But, it's it's but, an epic looking place, though. I mean, yeah, epic place. And right next to it, you got Rome, tiny little town with, you know, you got ruins and stuff, but. How could Rome be the capital of this world empire and not? Florence? Yeah, they, they no do sense. that so on purpose. They're like, look, you're you're 20 miles away from where the real action is. <sighs> and we've taken over the real gem, which is the Vatican, mm -hmm. you know, um, and then, you know, with the, the world wars and everything is set out just to destroy. That way people can't point and go, well, that doesn't make sense. You know, looking at a building. Um, I'm surprised that there are even cathedrals left standing, but right. uh, they, they must have still some residual kind of powerful effect, um, you know, that maybe on congregations. Like, geopolitical, I think, right? Or, geopolitical. Right. Yeah, exactly. You know, if you can get people to come into these these um, these temples and things and they have an energetic thing going on that people right. aren't aware of because you haven't, you know, let people know that they are energy. Basically, it's that mm -hmm. simple. You yes. know, so and they walk in and become uh, impressionable and vulnerable. They can, have, they can receive right? visions. They can right yeah, or or, or become very spiritually like aware for a little bit. And uh, you know, if you don't have that in your regular life, when you're in your square by square apartment, you know, and you go to the, one of these cathedrals, I mean, you're just you're somehow connected with God, right? Like that's the way you're gonna feel on the inside. And yeah, so they, they use this. They use this, and they they you know flex their their religious muscles on the entire world i mean you won't find a religion a, a really based religion that doesn't have some form of a, a exotic temple whether it's a cathedral or like a right. mosque with i'm sure there was technology involved in that too uh, but as well as that god vibe you know when you walk into these amazing you know structures uh, i think that that's definitely been used against us oh, absolutely so, uh, so yeah, Florence is a perfect example. It was a it was a small part of a big world empire. Its headquarters was in Russia, not not Italy, but in Moscow. And um, <clears throat> let me uh, break up a couple of, uh, 
dependent proofs just real fast before I go into that history. I still believe that there's humans on Mars because there always was during the Saturnian uh, old golden age. They basically lived on the North Pole of Mars, Atlantis, it was called, best place to be. And then the collinear configuration fell apart. Mars uh, fell out of the configuration. Atlantis fell into the North Pole and got destroyed. Deep State took it really hard. Uh, but there's still humans on there in Mars today. They just live inside the planet where it's, you know, a lot easier to live. You got more vegetation and, and heat and stuff. Um, I also believe giants uh, definitely roam the Earth. Um, mm -hmm. Got a lot of literature that points out giants. In America, you got the Smithsonian cover-up. The museum completely destroyed all the burial mounds in this country and set up a bunch of dinosaur museums. Said, oh, these are dinosaur bones. Uh, it's complete cover-up. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Um, there's no dragons and no giants, guys. It's yeah. it's what we tell you it is, is what it is. <laughs> so yeah, back to the um the timeline. Um so here's a here's a, a mind effort. Um that year, um oh, sorry, the year six BCE 670, last um uh, last interaction with Mars is the end of cataclysm. After that age, after that year, we were able to create a new calendar, a fixed calendar based on 12 months which would never change because the Earth's orbit would never change again. But before that, the calendar kept jumping uh, into a bit larger and longer years over and over as we jumped into longer orbits. And so this year 670 should actually be the year zero. It should be the year when we stopped using the old calendars and started using the new ones. And it's also the, uh, the date when the year uh, became static. We could say a thousand years from CE are actually a thousand years, but a thousand years BCE those are an origin story years. They're, they're variable in size. That's a little bit hard for people to understand. So that's the reason for BCE and CE. It's not any kind of human social event that caused it. It's because of the calendars. And then we got this time, um, phantom time hypothesis where somebody added a thousand years. So they're adding it from year zero, right? That 670 date. So once you think about that, what they really did was they added 670 years BCE and added another hundred, a thousand, and 53 years in, in uh, CE times. So let me grab that calculator. 670 plus That's wild. It, what the, what the uh, perception of time passing, right. even in the mind, like, man, that's a thousand years of stories people have focused on and uh, histories people have dove into that quite possibly just doesn't even exist and it, right. think about the power in that you know what man what other way to to do it but through these spells and, and this writing it's totally it's crazy <laughs> right so, on. yeah i do believe that's like a thousand seven hundred and so years that never existed that they added because they're in position to do this who am i talking about the vatican how can they do this because they they jealously guarded all of the religious relics and uh Bibles, any kind of text that dealt with the memories of the old cataclysms. They mm. hid it in the Vatican. They still do it today. If you look up the Vatican's underground uh, bunkers, you'll see that they're like 30 miles long of caverns containing artifacts from all over the world that they basically stole in the, in the last couple hundred years. Right. So they, they have, they're doing it now. Yes. And they did in the past, definitely. And they're in a position to add this time, this uh, fake time period into where, where essentially nothing happens. No human events, no cataclysms, nothing. And how, how am I so certain about this? Because it it's, appears to me that <clears throat> the very first human event was also the most significant one, the one that could not be forgotten, the one that everyone decided to get involved in one way or another by the end, the one that still permeates today. And that is, of course, the crucifixion. So uh, in Fomenko's new chronology, which is based on Russian literature, because it's totally different secular um, testimony of the crucifixion. You know, it didn't happen in Italy or Palestine. Sorry, it didn't happen in Palestine. Um, it happened in Istanbul, in Turkey, in the in the, the the northwest corner on the Bosphorus River, where you got where they got this big, big uh, castle built. The castle was Sargrad, the first um, the first uh, uh, sorry the first uh, holy temple of the empire, as Sargrad is translated. It also was known as Troy, in in a Western literature and Latin literature, and in um, in the Bible, in Old Testament, it was known as Jerusalem. And that sounds crazy that Jerusalem and Troy might be the same thing, but that's what Fomenko is claiming in new chronology. Right. That the Trojan War and the Crusades are basically the same events at the same time. They happen thousands of years apart. They involve the same locations, except for 
that the location of Jerusalem changed several times. The first location was in Istanbul, and after the Crusades, it was taken by the Rusord Empire. They then built their own Jerusalem in the Kremlin. The Kremlin, um, as it's described before it was burnt by um, the Napoleonic Wars, was exactly the same uh, design as the Istanbul Jerusalem. It had six uh, wall, uh, had six gates, and uh, and three partitions inside. Hmm. That's um, that basically means um, with each partition you had six gates. So it's six six six, and that's where you get that number from. It's the uh, structure of Jerusalem. Uh, the first Jerusalem, wow. the very first one, was the one seen in heaven in the Golden Age up in Saturn in the North Pole. You saw this this uh, six sided hexagon shape. This electric discharge. Mm -hmm. It's still there today. You can look at the North Pole of Saturn today. You'll see a six-sided hexagon electrical discharge. People don't know how, how to explain it. It also looks like a black cube in 3D if you, if you look at it. Um, yeah. So this, <laughs> this six-sided six figure was considered the first Jerusalem in heaven. In, in, the, in the modern, in the dawn of civilization, it was rebuilt on Earth as an actual building in Istanbul, like I said, Troy. Mm -hmm. And um, and when it was conquered, they rebuilt the exact same structure again in the Kremlin. In the Napoleonic Wars, the Kremlin was destroyed, and all of that history was again stolen and moved to the West. And today, everyone believes that the Jerusalem was actually in Palestine the whole time. So how do, how do we get there? Um, let me get into that uh, chronology really quickly. The uh, crucifixion story basically um, was a religious event. The Eastern, um, the Eastern people of Tataria, the empire didn't exist yet, um, were basically a bunch of giants. They're, they're uh, different kinds of people, big, right. small, hairy. Um, you know, sometimes they had like bear heads and stuff. It's it very different from the West. The West, a lot of people were the same size, having been the uh, descendants of the Egyptian empire members who were, who were all about conformity, making the slaves the same size, everyone been the same. So Westerners all look the same, the Easterners look different. And in the center, very center, you had the most religious temple in the world, Jerusalem, Troy, um, and a bunch of rabbis there. They're basically trying to convert everyone over to their, poly, their, their monotheistic religion, trying to bring back that old Egyptian empire um, monotheistic religion in, in modern times. It's very unpopular. No one wants to do it. It's, um, you know, you guys got to start doing taxes, you got to circumcise your kids. You got, you know, you're so, all, you're so you're talking about, orders. you're talking about sun god worship then, uh, like, like the Egypts worshiped Ra or the Aten. Is that the, um, the one god in Egypt uh, that, was, that was their go-to? <laughs> the interesting thing about the sun in mythology was that there were several suns, the first sun being Saturn, the biggest, right. brightest thing in the sky. That went away, oh, okay. and, then Jupiter gotcha. actually was, and Jupiter actually was a sun for a while, uh, briefly. When it went away, we finally saw the real sun for the first time. And yes, all polytheistic religions for a long time included the sun in as one of the planets. Um, like I said in that um, wow. C.S. Lewis he does include that. Um, other people don't. For some reason, um, you don't see it in, um, in uh, Roman or Greek mythology, like Apollo is actually referencing Saturn and not the sun. There is this deception of, about the sun. Let me, let me pull up a, uh, something I have here, a letter from Velikovsky. It's actually going to spell this out a lot better than I can. Um, bear with me. No worries. Right. So this is yeah, to Dave it's, Talbot. It's amazing. <laughs> right. So Dave Talbot in 1975 wrote his book um, saying, you know, maybe there's some truth to this mythology. Maybe the plants were the gods. But then he completely removed the sun. And and Velikovsky, Manuel Velikovsky, is still alive, writes him and says, Why did you do that? You know, that goes a little too far, he says. Why? Because the sun must have factored heavily in mythology. It was the biggest thing for the longest time. How could it be removed? So you can see this modern confusion that the sun has been removed from mythology for some reason and replaced right. by, wow. let me get to that, by Jesus. All these things attributed to the sun are now attributed to Jesus. We have all these stories, these miracles that Jesus allegedly did, that he walked on water, that he stilled the storm, that he provided food and healed the lepers. And all of these things we know have to do with the sun. We also know that the Jesus story is mostly made up based on imaginary uh, uh, pictures in the zodiac. People chose these imaginary pictures in the sky a long time ago, created these zodiac images, and then placed the Jesus story along each one of them, saying, Yeah, I moved into February and there's rain and so forth, moved right. into April and had sex or something. 
um, the, this is a fake story. They, they erased the real story and replaced it with a fake Zodiac um, and merged the, the character Jesus in with the mythology of the sun, therefore erasing, eliminating the sun from mythology altogether. So uh, wow. I'm jumping a bit ahead there. How do, how do we ever get this Jesus guy to be so important? Why is he so important? That is, is right. I, I definitely thing. know the, the, you know, the, uh, the correspondence between Jesus and, uh, you know, <laughs> the sun. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty I, obvious, I right? prefer to think about it as like a, a, the only way you can, instead of realizing that, Hey, I've, uh, been pitched a lie my entire life is, well, maybe it's just more complicated and it's fractal. So it could be both. <laughs> That's yeah. kind of where I'm at right now. I'm like, uh, it could be both. Why, why wouldn't he be a guy and, you know, uh, a ball of plasma in the sky? That's cool with me, dude. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? No sense right. to people, argue about People it. accept religion as is, you know, they don't question it. It's like, fine, whatever, dude. Yeah, right. you know, whatever. Right. Right. So, so yeah, sure. the biggest question to me was why did this Jesus character matter so much in history, the geopolitical re- reality of it? Not, not mythology and not superstition. I want to know what really happens. Um, right. So the, the Russians had a, a secular testimony of the whole thing. And they said, well, you know, it's not named Jesus. For example, the letter J of the Latin alphabet was not in the Greek Cyrillic alphabet ever. Still isn't today. Um, the letter J came much later with the Jesuits. The Jesuits who named themselves after their, their redaction of the stolen history. They said, we're now naming this guy Jesus Christ. But actually in, a, in the Russian chronology, his name is Andronicus Christ. Now, what does Christ mean? Well, it just means anointed. Anointed one, yeah. Right. And why is anointed? Because his mom gave a virgin birth. Now, it's not, it's not unique, but it is very rare. It doesn't happen very often. Now, she was a giant too, big, hairy Mary. That's what some books referenced her as. Wow. And, um, and she was cast out of her tribe because they were scared of this virgin birth you know like, holy crap was that's this crazy because they always do uh tend to show jesus uh in paintings as a redhead and yeah, uh yeah. you know anybody that's Bruce looked into red. tartaria and any of that you you, you recognize the the redhead yeah. giants from uh from legends right. of native americans i, I yes. mean so and that's yeah. what russian means russ Rus means red russian means red redheads yeah, that's wow. the race that, that's what that, yeah see, so, we're just we're just told that they're all irish right like that's kind right. of the going consensus is oh you mean oh redheads so they must be irish or maybe scottish but yeah you never hear so, about it being a ruse <laughs> yeah we're told about like sasquatch and stuff these days bigfoot and we, we say you know oh those must be in regions or rare but they actually might represent an entire race of humans that have been sort of pushed into the background by modern civilization by by right. modern historians and way too much religion conformity and communism but back to the point, uh, Andronicus Christ, he was uh, just you know, a regular guy who was born in a unique circumstance, driven out of his village, and had to give birth in a stable. Why? Because he, he went to the Crimea, his mom went to the Crimea, which had more normal people, and none of the um, inns could fit her in it. That makes a lot more sense than the uh, Latin Bible, which basically says, you know, they're mean to her and threw a pe- pregnant woman out in the streets. Right. No <laughs> sense. So anyway, this giant gave birth to another giant in Crimea. That's where Jesus was born. That's why Russia cares about Crimea so much. And they and he basically was popular. He was famous. Like remember that that kid, that giant gave birth in our village. The tail spread to Istanbul, and the people in Istanbul welcomed him there, invited him to Jerusalem, and said, "We want you to to be indi- indi- inducted into our religion. Our new religion is so cool and popular now, and you're gonna." learn everything as a rabbi and you're going to bring it back to your people and teach them. That was the plan. It was good, nice monotheistic spread plan. Um, the problem of course, because there's so many people they did this to, and none of them are remembered was that this particular guy screwed the whole planet. The first thing that he went and did wrong was he said, well, you know, we actually do have religion in the East. It's pretty polytheistic and it's based on this literature that we wrote down, you know, here, you guys want to see it. And he totally threatened everything they were setting up in Istanbul um, with their Western ideologies they had taxation you know they had like overpopulation issues and they still had slavery and the eastern way of life very eclectic and spread out it was like it was like hobbiton except with giants it was um it was serene and idyllic and it was it was very um attractive to the to the people in istanbul we kept hearing these rumors that the east had this vast land rejected western religion and so the bottom line is the western religion was um, threatened at its core in Jerusalem, at this very center, at this headquarters, by this one guy. 
He was just citing parables. He's just saying, well, this one guy did this, that guy did that, and here's the result. He was saying, oh, you don't need religion. You don't need organized religion. You don't need priests to represent the will of God because we don't know what that is. We don't even know who gods are anyway. And everything he said was a threat. So Jesus, well, it, wasn't, it wasn't his name yet. Christ was driven out with his family from Jerusalem, as the story goes. Uh, the Bible says to Egypt. That's kind of crazy, you know, desert region. Uh, in reality, he went back home to the restored empire. And um, he eventually returned to Jerusalem after his uh, prophesization made such a, a dent that they had no choice but to welcome him back. This is exactly what, what bad guys do. This is what, if you ever had anyone that really hates you, um, they'll do the Godfather 2 thing. They'll hold their enemies closer than their friends. And it's just something that we see the deep state doing throughout history. They, they want him real close, and they, um, and they welcomed him even to a um, Passover in Jerusalem. But famously, we all know he was betrayed in that Passover. He was arrested and brought before the court. Um, what was the charge? I don't believe they ever said that he was the son of God, and certainly in, Western, in Russian literature, it does not say that either. Um, now, someone else said that about him, sure. The rabbis were all saying that he seems to think he's the next savior. The rabbis were looking for the next savior, having a list of saviors in the past, going back to Moses. They're just looking for the next one. So, um, of course, they accused him of, him of it. And when they needed him to be punished, they, they needed to punish him in such a way that it would, <clears throat> it would destroy what he was, what he was pushing, his, his uh, Eastern uh, polytheistic religions, to, to just to destroy the nature and say, nope, monotheistic God's in charge. Also to um, scare the hell out of anyone that would follow him in the future right, by doing the crucifixion itself, which is a very gruesome display. Yeah. And then finally, they had an eclipse on that date. These guys knew all about the, the eclipse because they experienced ones uh, 100 years prior. And they had their zodiac, their fixed calendar, and they knew that one was coming up. So they, they scheduled the um, crucifixion for that date. He actually had to wait a long time for that because it was, it was almost to the next Passover of the following year, which happened after the crucifixion. The next Passover happened right after. So it's almost a year later. And this eclipse happened, and they did the crucifixion in that moment. And they said, see, this guy thought he was the son of God. He, or rather, if you look at what was written on top of Christ on the crucifixion, it says, king of the Jews with the word Rex meaning king, um, that he claimed to be the king of those rabbis in that region. Actually, the original crucifixion story does not say that he would ever claim to be the son of God either. None of the original versions say that. They only ever said that he claimed to be the king of the Jews, the next savior, and that he got crucified and punished for it. Now, was he killed? See, I don't think so. I think there's a lot of reason to believe that Christ was not killed on the, on the cross First of all, he was cooperative with the cross. He dragged it all the way over there, and he agreed to do it because it was a punishment, after all, from the people that, that raised him and taught him everything that he knows. So um, when the crucifixion was over, you see these paintings of his family bringing him down from the cross. He looks like he's alive to me. Later renditions say that his hands were cut off. No, nope, not in those paintings. Looks pretty intact to me. Definitely alive. And, um, and the bigger proof is that we see all these sermons from Christ after the crucifixion in literature. Plenty of them. First, you got them in Eastern Resort Empire, um, the empire that formed under this event in his name. They basically formed under his teachings. And so he became the first emperor of, of the Resort Empire, uh, Andronicus Christ, emperor number one, also the, the first of the wise men. The second empire is the second wise men and so forth. Um, the, aside from this, we also have in Japan, testimony of Christ having gone there. You can look it up, Tomb of Christ in Japan still exists today. Uh, for some reason, the Japanese believe that he was buried there. Um, in America, you have the Mormons who also say Jesus, that Christ was here. He had these sermons in great detail, a bunch of sermons with, with uh, witnesses and all kinds of detail that it's really hard to make up. Um, modern churches will say, oh, that's because Jesus was resurrected and came back in second revelation. Okay, fine. I don't believe in superstition. So the real chronicles say that he was still alive that he went to America and sort of founded Mormonism, as we know today. Um, then um, he died, probably in Japan. That's where I think, because there's the only tomb you'll ever find. And this empire formed in his name, the Rus Horde Empire. It, um, the first thing that this empire did, well, it didn't really form right away. First thing it did was the Crusades. And what are the Crusades? It was a major revenge event against the crucifixion. 
uh, only 10 years after the crucifixion of uh, 1885, you basically have the, um, in, sorry, I said 1185, 1196, you get the first crusade, which hits Troy. And by 1204, by eight years later, they actually take and capture Troy. They bring it down. Um, so a couple of details here. Um, the, it took them 20 years to do it. It wasn't a successful campaign at first. You also have this thing called the Children's Crusade. You can look it up. Allegedly happened in 1212, but um, dates are fuzzy. And the Children's Crusade doesn't make any sense as written. A bunch of children crossed Europe and then got slaughtered or sold into slavery. You know, horrible story, right? Well, actually, if you consider that these children are giants, it all makes a lot of sense. The first crusade was a bunch of young giants. Young meaning 40 years and younger. Giants live a very long time. And the 40-year-olds and younger, they rallied into a a revenge frenzy. It didn't take them very long because the crucifixion was extraordinarily humiliating for giants. They didn't like that the small people did that. And um, and they just ran to, the, to Troy and just tried to take it right away. They all got slaughtered and sold into slavery. Why? Because Troy has its three ramparts it's built on a river. It's built in a strategic location. They knew this would happen. These guys did the crucifixion of a giant. We're not playing around. They were actually saying to the giant race, hey, come at us. You know, We're doing this 20 years the one you love so much, you know, come and do something about it. Come and attack us, you know? And so the first crusade failed. The old giants could not breach the walls. Second crusade failed too. And if you look closely, um, they only really ever became successful because of the so-called Trojan horse. It's not a real horse or any kind of event that makes any sense in Latin literature. But in Roman literature, again, there, the, it wasn't the horse at all. It was a internal conflict in the walls of Troy where the people within disagreed with the leaders and said, uh, we don't want to fight these giants anymore. We agree with the giants, actually. And we don't agree with you. It was an internal conflict. It was, it was a, uh, it was a um, sort of a civil war that brought, brought, brought Troy down in the end. And there was no, it was a bloodless takedown of First Jerusalem. So <clears throat> this, this event was, um, was what jump-started the Rusthorn Empire. This empire uh, took back the holiest city from, from Istanbul, from the heathens, and recreate it in Moscow, and then start to spread Christianity throughout Europe. Within about um, 13th century, throughout the 13th century, they basically spread um, everywhere except for Africa and, and parts of America. They hadn't gotten that far yet, but they introduced uh, slash and burn farming, um, which gave them tons of food. They're able to, to raise huge armies. They had uh, horse cavalry for the first time, and they had iron. Iron fell to earth from the Prometheus event. They're able to smelt it into weapons. They're unstoppable with these horse cavalries. They could move across vast territories in a very short time. And like farming, they could they could just rebuild those armies quickly too. So 13th century, Resort Empire takes over all of Europe. Um, it's remembered as the Mongol Slavic conquest. By the 14th century, the Resort Empire takes over the world. They get into uh, Africa, they get all the way across America, across the land bridge. There was a land bridge back then. And um, they start building giant cities, monuments. Um, it's a pretty good remembered time in history because there weren't any wars yet. There was a lot of, um, there was slavery, there was taxation. Like I said, all of the things that Christ preached against the Rus Horde Empire went and did anyway, which tells us that the deep state simply moved their headquarters to uh, Moscow and, and continued all of the things that nobody else was, was looking at, religion, zodiac, calendar, maintenance, um, money maintenance, all that kind of stuff is, is their, is their empire. And, and it, people, the giants, they weren't you know, clever enough to sort of see this was happening to them. But within one century, the deep state headquarters was in the Kremlin. They're spreading. It. Anyway, this continues until, um, the Jesuit, um, expansion in the 16th century, the reformation, uh, the, uh, the empire basically has grown too big has, has uh, conquered too many people, too many religions, and they're starting to endure a lot of resistance from, from, uh, the, from Western Europe in particular. Uh, stories like Joan of Arc is real stories. Uh, Joan got these visions uh, somehow, no one knows how, these orders to, to fight a war, and she did it. And um, it was actually successful against the Resort Empire, later remembered as Britain. But um, the point is that something weird was happening where people were receiving visions from from saints to go to war so it's a very new kind of development and the resort empire didn't know what to make of it they've had trouble putting the christians down when they came to 
their sexual activity, they already did all kinds of orgies and had venereal disease spread throughout the empire. They had to slaughter them all in the first apocalypse. So I think it was 1470 or something. Um, after that, these, um, these Westerners were a lot more prude and so forth, but they're still resisting in these abstract ways, like I said, by believing in monotheism, by receiving orders. And um, the sort is not unique. This happened all the time. And people in villages were told, hey, if you listen to this invisible influence and betray your village, we'll give you wealth, we'll give you everything you want. These, uh, these entities were known as the jinn or the genies. Hmm. Um, and they, they basically, um, yeah, they exist in literature for a reason. Uh, so the, the Reformation of Western Europe uh, started to spawn as a result of this resistance and the inquisition of Eastern Resort Empire was trying to put it down. The inquisition was necessary. They had no choice because if they did nothing, the villagers would on their own round up these witches and, and so forth and burn them alive. That's what they were doing all over the place on their own. The inquisition was actual, actually an attempt to stop death from happening, though it has a very bad reputation these days because those same monotheists during the Asian all fled to America. They fled the oppression of the Resort Empire. They still regard it as an evil empire in its day. So going forward, the, uh, the Jesuits formed out of the Reformation, out of that resistance, and they came up with a plan to take out the Resort Empire, a very devious plan. First part of the plan involved um, stealing all of their history, all of their locations. Jerusalem was in Palestine. The Jesus story was in, in, in uh, you know, Palestine, like I said, in Egypt. And, um, and that his name is Jesus, and that we're calling ourselves the Jesuits. This whole Jesuit movement was a complete redaction of Eastern everything. Like I said, history, religion, mm -hmm. everything. And when they started doing it, they, they reached all of the vassal states of that old Rusort Empire, and they basically claimed those old, Egypt, those, sorry, those old empirical religions. Egypt is the best example. Because Egypt went through this story with Osiris. They witnessed their god split into pieces. They gave up their religions. But the Jesuits come back in the 15th century to Egypt, and they say, hey, Osiris is back, and we represent Osiris, and you are our slaves, all of you black um, servants of Egypt. You belong to us now. Um, the black slaves of Egypt had no choice but to obey this because um, the, they rebuilt the Sphinx that, that's recombining of Osiris right there in front of the pyramids. And this sort of symbolized um, their, their authority to God. If anyone was to destroy those, those Sphinx, they would have to risk the angry God coming and smiting them, that kind of thing. So it, this worked from kind of a backdoor axis to their religions, not just Egypt, but everywhere. In America, they tried to convert the Indians into praying Indians, Christianized. Sri Lanka, they tried to convert um, the polytheistic, Hinduistic religions into Buddhism, which is monotheistic. Despite what everyone says, it's monotheistic. Buddha is Buddha is represented as sort of a creator god and single entity. Throughout most of the places of the world where Buddhism is taught and education is, is minimal. So it's a sort of a, a low education religion. So, um, so Buddhism, the Jesuits invented, they didn't discover it or anything. That's what historians will tell us that they discovered Buddhism in Hindustan, but um, no, they already had a polytheistic religion there. So the, the Jesuits eventually um, came up with a plan to conquer the Rusort Empire in Moscow, to take it out with technology. And this, this plan formulated under, um, under King Louis. Um, let me stop sharing because I don't have any more details on that right now. Uh, uh, Louis, the... Uh, the eighth started a bunch of colonies, and by the 16th, there was all these colonies in America. Louisiana was the entire west coast of America. It wasn't just this little place, but all of west coast. And the French uh, were starting, uh, starting to um, spread all over the world, build cities, Eiffel Towers. They built Eiffel Towers all over the place, not just in France, and, and, use, and, and use sort of advanced technologies to, to convince everyone to join their modern civilization. Um, in, in the Rusort Empire, they, they still had sort of backwards technology, old, you know, they had can, you know, cannons and weapons like that. But in, uh, in, but in France, they had the latest stuff. Uh, the city of Paris was known as a city of lights, even back in the 17th century. It had electricity. They also had, um, had everything else you can possibly imagine. It had airships. My favorite thing to talk about are the airships. Yeah, they had a lot of uh, old mm -hmm. paintings. Um, yeah, I should I should bring those up here. Let me go grab that. Nice. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, airships, 
We only hear about those in fantasy uh, these days. We don't hear about um, pretty much that in the Hindenburg. That was it. That was the trauma right. event to remove them. Right. And so. the um, uh, where pictures loading. Here's all my mud flood pictures. We'll get to in a second. Loading, loading, loading. I'll keep talking while I'm doing this. <laughs> right on. Yeah. So, uh, so, uh, yeah, any questions? You so know, Lu Louisiana being, being the whole West, uh, West side of the United States, that's true. And that's a lot of things that people don't recognize is when that mm -hmm. Louisiana purchase happened, essentially, uh, more than a third of, of the United, what's the United States currently was, was bought from quote unquote bought from France. Right. Yeah. Um, and this was right when, right after Napoleon declared himself emperor and was trying to rule the world. Why would he sell part of his territory? And why during the 1812 battle when that war included America? You shouldn't have given that territory up. They, the only reason that they say that they sold Louisiana before the war of 1812 was to make it seem like French weren't involved in the, in the war here in America. I'll get to that in a second. No, uh, right, that no. airship, here's that airship I was talking about. You see in this painting, uh, you got basically this, this horse cavalry being on top of this huge boat. Actually, this boat has fans on it and the boat will go up into the air. Now, these fans aren't strong enough to get this boat into the air, of course, we know that. So how is it possible that they build these flying flotillas? The only way that's possible is if um, they have some kind of anti-gravity technology. So anti-gravity technology, here's a, here's a cool video right here. These are more paintings um, of uh, French paintings. Of, no, mute there. And you can see um, so they did use air, um, air balloons, of course. But let me get ahead here. I think I'm going slowly today. Yeah, this one right here. This one is clearly too big to be go, an air balloon. Go ahead and share. Oh, am I not sharing? No. Sorry. No worries. You know what I uh, have always thought about the paintings of of airships, right, with propellers, right. is is that those propellers and things are representative of a technology we're just not allowed to know about. Uh, like in right. Vimanas, right? You see these giant buildings with yeah with propeller just like those and uh, yeah, so i that, think that a lot of that was representative uh, of possibly a different technology that we're just not exactly. yeah sorry i was trying to show this photo here um yeah this is too big to be a boat too big to be a an airship that works just on fans alone right if you, had, if you had mercury vortex engines uh, in those columns that might be a little bit more functional than some fans yeah and i believe <laughs> that i believe that this technology is actually a lot simpler than we think it is. Like uh, in fantasy, you hear a lot about floating stones. It's possible to make stones float. Yeah, with sound or, or with sound uh, is another one. So yeah, there's there's ways we're just not allowed to know about them, and it's it's unfortunate. I mean, yeah, the airships are are absolutely amazing, man, and the yeah. amount of etchings and detail that is put into some of these paintings or you know these etchings is insane. It definitely suggests a camera obscura at least you know, to be able to etch these in such detail. Yeah. And um, yeah, so amazing stuff. So yeah, um, here's, oh, here, that's, this is a weird photo, right? This is a giant um, wooden something guy that's also burning. It's on fire and it's in the sky and and it's falling. So what, what the heck is that? You know, right. uh, these, weird, these are weird events that were seen in the 18th century, 19th, sorry, 19th century. And um, the problem is that all of these events have been scattered on weird days. There's a tremendous amount of earthquakes and floods and rivers changing and, and just stuff that nobody has seen before happening in the 19th century, but they say it all happened throughout the century rather than at the, at, the early, at the early part of the century all at once. So let me get into the mud flood. What was happening with the, um, with the Jesuits, essentially um, the, the, Louis, uh, the, the line of Louis, the plan was to, um, to eventually attack the Kremlin and um, let me grab that right here. Um, and to use high technology to do it. This was not going right. to be a difficult war. It's going to be an ideological war. They had to go there and conquer over the people, not just not just take out their military. If they weren't able to conquer the people and the religion and everything, then they were just going to have to do this later again. So this was a geopolitical event. The Jesuits, who have a military order, you can look them up. The Jes Jesuits military was planning to use advanced technology to sort of just land their army in uh, the Kremlin just sees it, take it over. And, and this plan would have worked if not for the French Revolution. French Revolution is a very significant event because the center of the empire, uh, France, um, had lost control of its own government. The, the government lost control of the people and the people no longer um, respect its authority. 
So which government did France have in the Jesuit Empire? A religious one, obviously. And the, um, the, the uh, rulers were all religious people. They were not elected officials. They had to go to the church and church. Anything. And, um, and the people basically had it. By, by 1790, they, um, they said, that's it. We're done with your government. Do something else. They gave the, uh, the French people gave the, the, uh, the aristocrats a couple of years to, to reorganize the government. And they did, allowing for a vote. They wanted a, a vote of the people. And so the, um, the uh, aristocrats did that, but they had sort of a backdoor plan to dilute the vote immediately when they create the first republic that Earth has, has seen since the sword empire in France. And they have this backup plan that's screwed up. Right away. What's the backup plan? Um, as the French people get a vote, um, the um, immigration for, uh, from anywhere in the world to France is also legalized. Where were their immigrants? There's a huge amount of immigrants coming from America and from Egypt. In America, in 1775, the Resort Empire breaks apart. Um, America colonies declare independence, 1776, but fail to abolish slavery. Oops. You know, that's why everyone says that the Declaration of Independence is so messed up because it sort of preserves slavery as it was. And, um, and so the, the slaves who would become slaves on that region, they scattered, they got out of there. They went to France and immigration into France as all of the slaves became de facto free just by entering the border. Um, the, the aristocracy knew that this would happen the moment they legalized the vote and the French people watched as their vote got diluted by a massive immigrant swarm. Hmm. We're seeing the exact same thing happen today, right? History repeats. So, <laughs> right. so the French people, French people had it again. And they said, that's it. Um, we are never going to trust you people again. They dragged a lot of the aristocracy out of their houses and guillotined them. Guillotined hundreds of people. Um, <clears throat> I don't think that the reign of terror, as it's called, necessarily represented the French revolution very well. It represents a small faction of extremists who ruined everything for the revolutionists. And many of the good people in the revolution were guillotined along with the bad ones. You read all about this in uh, Dickens' uh, Tale of Two Cities. Mm -hmm. um, it, was not a, it was not a good time. Well, best time, worst time, right? So um, after the French Revolution, which ended in just a huge stalemate, there was this big vacuum of power. The aristocracy was not respected anymore. They couldn't establish government. And within a couple of years, Napoleon, the hero of the French Revolution, decided to declare himself emperor to seize that power vacuum. This was not something he decided to do because he's some egoist. But everyone around him was begging him to do it, to do something, or someone else would fill the vacuum. Who was the someone else? Well, uh, Tsar Alexander of Russia, for example, in, in 1801 declared himself emperor of all of Europe. So right there, you have this challenge, and the French people did not want this Russian Tsar to take their land. So they asked Napoleon to be Tsar too, and he did. The only thing to understand here is that a Tsar is a religious ordinance. You can't just declare yourself that. You have to have the church on your side, the whole church. And he didn't really have the church on his side, but by declaring that, he sort of forced them on his side. The French church, which was different from the Protestants and the Catholics, um, they basically said, okay, fine, we'll ordain you as a, um, as a holy emperor of Europe. Um, <clears throat> what Napoleon was doing is he was turning the plan on itself, the Jesuit plan. He saw exactly what was going on. He was part of it. He was born and raised in their deep state garden. He was one of those people who was supposed to preside over all this. But having seen so many French people go down, he basically, and people around him said, we're going to do things differently. We're disconnecting from that Catholic church completely, starting our own church, our own calendar, our own everything. They started the year over in year zero again, if you can believe it. They renamed <laughs> all the months based on French, um, French seasons. You know, what does, what does France look like on that season? Rename the month after very beautiful. This French calendar lasted like, what, 18 years or something until the Napoleonic Wars were over. The French Republic calendar, I recommend you look it up. It's really amazing. Wow. Um, <clears throat> so what he was doing was a very religious geopolitical event, unifying all world religion against the religions that the deep state had created. The ones that the Resort Empire had created a long time ago, the ones that the Jesuit expansion were really creating, all of it were being turned on itself Napoleon visited every one of these regions. He went to Egypt. Everyone knows he went to Egypt and he freed the slaves, in my opinion. They don't say that in history, but he freed them. He said, you guys don't have to listen to those Jesuits anymore. We're going to destroy that Sphinx. Now, they didn't really destroy, destroy the Sphinx entirely, but they did knock the nose off. Nose is um, Venus and the beard is Mars. And they knocked the nose and the beard off deliberately. And the, the, the 
Egyptian slaves saw this happen. They said, wow, you destroyed the, the face of God, it restored Osiris to its parts as this, the myth ended. Um, obviously, no God is appearing to stay down right now. So Napoleon, you clearly, you know, you're the man, you, you freed us. That's how I see it. And, and so he did this everywhere. He went and freed, you know, people in, in uh, Sri Lanka, and he went to America, he made peace with the, um, the American natives, which is like impossible to do. Big American native tribe, these huge red, well, I say huge compared to us, red skins, well, they are today, uh, later on. Um, they, had, they had features of their face and body, which made them look like they're a very brave <clears throat> race, very powerful and hard to conquer and hard to fool. And Napoleon somehow won their lives. And he was able to cross their territory from Louisiana into the British territory. British was claiming that restored empire's memory and, um, and destroy the White House in the Battle of 1812, in the War of 1812. Um, historians say, no, the British destroyed the, the White House. Yeah, no, they didn't. Why would they destroy one of their own churches? That was something they built. They needed it for the to control the colonists. They would not have done that. The person, the army who destroyed the White House here in America was the Napoleonic army. And hmm. the same army destroyed the Kremlin in Moscow. Historians, again, disagree. Historians say that uh, Tsar Alexander destroyed the Moscow Kremlin um, to prevent the Napoleon's troops from reaching it and claiming it. Again, why would the Tsar destroy his holiest? No, why would he destroy the holiest temple in their entire empire? Doesn't make sense. So mm -hmm. what does make sense is Napoleon army destroyed every church they could find. How do I know Napoleon's army hates churches? Because you look at the French Revolution, they tried to burn as many churches as they could find there too. And the aristocracy with their, with their um, uh, private security forces, which they had, protected all of those Gothic churches from being burnt. And look this up. The Gothic churches were saved back then. Um, so yeah, I know the Napoleon, Napoleon army was, was an atheistic army. It was very anti-religious, no longer believed in, in God being the, the, the force of events in, in the history. And they wanted to prove it by destroying all these churches and freeing everybody. But this whole history I told you has not made it into into modern history at all. It's, uh, what I just said is completely different. From yeah, the the, uh, the story of Napoleon is is completely flipped around as if he's a part of the deep state or a part of, you know, the plan yeah, so, to institute control. And and if, right. yeah, what so you're saying look, does kind of make more sense than right, so let's look at them the going around story. destroying their own buildings and stuff. <laughs> right, exactly. So let's look at the official story. What did they say really happened in 1812, the modern historians? They say, well, Napoleon lost over 600,000 troops trying to invade Russia. So let's look at this map here. Uh, they lost um, 300,000 just trying to reach Moscow, just by desertion and starvation alone. They only encountered one, one army fight. There was only one battle, Borodino. Only 30,000 people died in that battle, and everyone else was lost to starvation and desertion. It's just hard to imagine how such a well-provisioned army, I'm not including their technology or anything like that. All I'm saying is provisioning. Armies know how to move, they know how to feed people and how to take resources locally. And these guys, if they didn't have airships, then they crossed the Alps. These French soldiers crossed the Alps to get into Russia. They are rugged soldiers. They could not have possibly have been defeated by starvation and desertion. But that's that's the story that he totally failed in Russia. He couldn't do it. That he never encountered the Russian army. Those guys fled to Siberia. So you'd think that that would mean victory. You know, that's exactly how Alexander conquered took Mesopotamia by the other army fleeing. So these wars don't make sense. Also, if you look at the, the map, you can see that the whole world was split in 1812 between uh, the East and West, that, that France and Spain were allied back then. And uh, Portugal, though, was part of the West because they had all those regional ports of the empire. This was definitely a world war. It should be considered World War yeah, One. Yeah, some I, people, I think some people too. say, right? Some people say World War Zero. You know, just to sort of fit in. Right. It, it was every. I mean, it was everywhere, and all these little wars they tell us about in the Americas, uh, with you know sub names, uh, are are just part of that same struggle. You know, like, it, it, yeah, <laughs> it's yep. it's just mind blowing how everything's flipped around. Uh, right. You know, and you don't have to be a a truther to see that in the world anymore. It's gotten so out of hand that you can see all you have to do is turn on the TV and you will get your contradictions for the day, <laughs> you know? So absolutely. Oh, yeah, it's all around us these days. So yeah, how much time do you have still? It's not over in uh, five minutes. Is it? 
Uh, no, no, we're good. We can go. All right, just a couple more things covered here. Um, That's awesome, map, man. I appreciate the map, it. Yeah, you bet. This is always fun. I the love maps, it. Maps of the 18th century are very interesting because they differ from the maps of the 19th century. You know, how could that be? You know, wow, did the earth change? No. And of course, we find a lot of maps from the 17th and 16th that do match up with the modern uh, world map. So there are contradictions where, where modern historians will say, oh, these are errors, maps, and these other ones are legit. Okay, right. <laughs> but I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe that um, the ancients or, or, or older um, empires got this stuff wrong. I think they're just as articulate as we are today. They know what rivers and mountains are and they, they place them correctly. So let's look at some of these maps. In India, you have something that looks totally different, totally different from modern day India, right? In modern day India, you have the Himalayan mountains, this huge stretch of, of uh, mountains at the south side of the Tibetan Peninsula. Um, but for some reason, there aren't, there is no Himalayan mountains in the old India maps or in the Tatarian maps released by Russia in the last 20 years. So where mm. is Tibet? Where is the Himalayans? Well, how about the rivers? Let's go to the rivers. You got this huge water source here. You got parallel rivers running down to the ocean. They're all called Ganjim, Ganjim. All these rivers are related to the Gan Ganji uh, water tributary. Um, you got this one river here that goes to the sea down there. That's fine. Let's look at the modern map. In the modern map, you actually oh, have a river map here. Where is it? Yes. In the modern map, you see that there are no longer parallel rivers in the north. Everything is now parallel to the, uh, to the horizon, to the, equ to the equator. And the Ganji is now this huge river that comes out of the western side and, and drags all the way to the east side into a delta. Hmm. So I'll go back to that other map real quick. And we'll see that the rivers were indeed parallel. Those parallel maps are missing, and they're replaced now by this Himalayan region. So that's one big change. Another big change over in America, you have California, the map, the island of California. I'm sure you've right. seen this, right? This one's just yeah, famous. Absolutely. Like, how did they how did they do this? You know, who could have screwed up so badly? Yeah, I don't think quit? it was a mistake at all. Because right. if you've been to the uh the central valley in california and then you know right on the other side of those those small mountains that are there now you, you see how much just sedimentary sand is there you know dirt just dirt yeah. just plain very fine finely ground dirt and um yeah, yeah. you know just just as Overized. if it was just like this yeah it's it's brutal man <laughs> right. and yeah i don't think that they would have have gone so far as to make this mistake yeah. you know what i mean on a map Exactly. And, and it's a lot of mistakes here, right? There's little islands in between the islands of California. They're all named. You've got San Francisco here in the, in the coast, you know, not on the edge, but inland. Um, it goes on. So um, it's supposed to be a Spanish map, and the, the Spanish people are supposed to have made mistakes because uh, Cortez wasn't able to conquer this area or something like that. That's the official explanation. Let's forget about the map and look at the rivers. The biggest river, of course, is the Rio Grande, and um, <clears throat> goes to the Mexican um, Gulf. Um, but today we see that the Rio Grande has driven, dried up. It's mostly dried up. It's not as big as it used to be. And you got this new river called the Colorado River, which takes the entire water tributary and brings it all the way to the um, to the Baja coast. Right. So this um, Rio Grande River, it's still a river. You can still see it there today. But um, let's go back to that old one. Um, it's called Rio Grande because it was huge. And it was supposed to take that tributary. Now, where is Colorado? We see some mountains over here but we don't see the Colorado River. We also don't see the Grand Canyon. And that is, of course, the biggest mistake of all. How could these explorers have missed the Grand Canyon? It's kind of impossible to miss. It's huge. Yeah, absolutely. I'm with you on that. Let's take a look at that Grand Canyon. Where do we go right here? Grand Canyon. I mean, you got the Grand Canyon, you have Bryce Canyon in Utah, which is right. another massive canyon kind of complex. And they, they uh -huh. all, you know, and I don't know, you, you don't have to be into, you know, conspiracies to look at, uh, you know, uh, an electrical scar, right, created like there's some people out there that make coffee tables and they electrically scar the wood. So if you've right. seen that and then you see our maps today with the, the rivers flowing, they look exactly the same as an right. electrical scar. And it's just uh, on these old maps, it doesn't look like that's the case. It looks like they are, like you're saying, running parallel to each other. 
there's definitely a, a method to the madness it seemed back in the day. Yeah. I like to focus on rivers because I think <clears throat> rivers give us sort of a slow guarantee of what the land used to be like. And there's certain things that rivers can never do, like cross. We got crisscrossing river marks in the Grand Canyon, which have to be explained. I posed this question on the uh, Reddit thread for Electric Universe, and uh, I got a lot of you know people challenging me saying, oh, we know what they are. They're fault lines. And I said, well, I'll find them. And then they found me the right fault lines. I'm like, okay, fine. They're, they're definitely marked as fault lines. I agree with you there. But the problem is that um, where these, you can see how there's a crisscross here, um, where these fault lines are supposed to have influenced the river. Uh, now, as I was saying, a river can never crisscross. If you have an existing river hit by a new one, they just join, they never crisscross. So a fault line could possibly be the explanation if we can identify which kind of fault line it is and how that would create a river. Uh, first of all, uh, the only type of uh, fault line that can even create this sort of, uh, create something in the ground that you can see is a thrust fault. The other ones are most, more or less hidden. And a thrust fault pushes one part of the ground up above the other part. Um, that is not going to cause a, a river carving. It's going to cause a, you know, a junction. Um, what we're seeing here is uh, what looks like it was carved by water, but that it crisscrossed the Colorado River. So, um, so it's kind of hard to explain, but I'm trying to get to it. Um, no worries. It looks like a valley. You know, if you're to the untrained eye, if you're looking right. at this, so, you say, oh, so, it's, it's a valley. So the, right. So the only hole in this theory about the crisscrossing is that potentially it could have been a type of fault line that maybe isn't identified too well or something. So I looked at the fault lines of the Grand Canyon. And what I discovered was that every single artifact along the entire canyon is marked as a fault line. They're all marked as faults. And they're named as you know the famous fault you know uh, trail that you can hike and so forth. They all uh, apparently geologists definitely agreed a long time ago that these are all a series of fault lines. But the first question is, why are the fault lines all in different directions? Why are they not parallel? Why are they in an area that didn't have any earthquakes? And why are there sorry, so many of them? I'm sorry, yeah. uh, not earthquakes. I mean, I'm sorry, tectonic thrust. This region doesn't have tectonic thrust. Doesn't have subduction. Doesn't have volcanoes. So right. where is where is the what kind of fault are we really talking about that could have created something that looks exactly like a river? And finally, why doesn't those fault lines exist throughout the rest of the canyon? We should be seeing them everywhere, not just in certain regions. So these are the questions I pose to anyone that might challenge that those are really just explained by fault lines. And not to get to the to the conclusion, what we think it is is a lightning scar. Right. Now uh, this isn't my theory. This is the theory of the electric universe. These guys have done a lot of research in the Utah areas. They've, they've been to these regions, they've looked at the rocks, and they said, how, how do we explain these rocks? It looks like a bunch of melted mushrooms in this one here in Utah. Um, could this have been from a volcano, from an earthquake, from erosion, from wind? Right. And, and they said, quite frankly, no, none of those things could possibly explain these regions. What does explain them is electric scarring. <clears throat> On Mars, where uh, electric universe theory um, focuses heavily for <clears throat> signs of electric scarring, they look for dendritic patterns. Dendritic means that um, you see dendrils spreading out, sort of filling out an area in mm -hmm. evenly in even fashion. We see this in electricity, in uh, repeating patterns, but also electric scars reproduced in the lab. And the electric universe guys have pointed out that the scars on Mars are actual dendri dendritic patterns. They're not just random water and wind erosion. But they're they're matching up with the hot the peaks and valleys that are natural in an electric discharge. So right. if they're if they're saying Utah was created that way, if they're saying that these monuments and so forth could not have formed by volcanoes or anything like that. They have to have been formed by a massive energetic event that melted the rocks, shaped them, and then fused them in place. And as they dried, they cracked. <clears throat> And, and so, and creating these sort of like patterns that could not have been formed by sedimentary layers or thrust faults or any of those other usual explanations. Here's a mountain in um, Australia. It's totally melted, this mountain. I don't can explain exactly how this was formed. You got all kinds of patterns in geology, which are weird. It's like a bomb explode under the earth or something. You got, right, uh, right. Yeah. How do you explain that? It's, <laughs> you unless you, and then you got the, the melting, uh, the melted buildings, mountains, guys. Uh, that are all about that saying, yep, there's your, you know, and that, that to me, and I was talking to a couple of people, when you look at the rainbow mountains, uh, like this one that you've got pulled up, 
Um, yeah. It just screams mining. You know, uh, <laughs> you've seen these waste piles of of like mining slag behind certain types of mines. It's very, very reminiscent of this. Yeah, we dig deep enough to get to all these ores, but some of these ores are present on the surface. It's like how they get there. Is it just billions of years of shifting sediment, or is it an alchemic change from electric discharge? Alchemy meaning um, enough energy goes into the atom, the molecule changes the atom into another atom. You know, from right. from from iron to another type of iron, that kind of thing. <clears throat> oh, here's a dendritic patterns uh, caught in a in glass. So just so you know what I mean by that. Um, so yeah. yeah, electric universe people basically point out like you know fabulous patterns that you can see in rock could not have formed any other way. So the last question is when did it happen? They believe it happened in primordial times a long time ago, but due to these shifting maps, we have to assume that maybe something happened in the 19th century. If it's true that we had all kinds of advanced technology back then, then maybe it's possible that the advanced technology was used in the Napoleonic Wars to, to not just change the, the verdict of the wars, the outcome, but to reverse them completely to such a degree that the people, the survivors of this event would have no choice but to believe that Napoleon was wrong that when he was defying God and, and destroying the Sphinx and so forth, that it was just a matter of time before God would eventually show up and smite him, like I've been saying. And right, so right. It's, no not doubt. Hard, it's not hard to believe that this happened in the Napoleonic Wars because we have testimony from back from the 19th century by the, from the Tsar, basically trying to, admitting that it was a divine intervention and then trying to downplay it, saying um, it's more important that you respect you know, us as your leaders and not the church. Otherwise, the czar saw that this event's going to happen again. We got paintings like this that basically show mud rains and mud floods, floods, and a bunch of people praying and, and freaking out and saying, "Yeah, hey, what's going on? What are we doing?" And you got a priest basically explaining it to him, like, "Well, what do you think's happening? I told you guys that God's mad at you. I've been telling you that for decades, and He finally shows up and is destroying everything." It's not a surprise and, and to the priests, of course, because that's what they believed. And but to the, everyone else, they basically had no choice to accept it. In the 19th century, you have this huge rebirth of, of monotheistic religion. Everyone's convinced that there is a creator God influencing human events and, um, and that we basically have to go to church and, and pray or else get mad at us. We also see the formation of cargo cults in 19th century. These are people that developed weird traditions looking up at the sky and praying and waiting for something to happen. It's like, what are, what are they waiting for? Well, a drop, some kind of supply drop. Cargo right, cults. right. I've never seen anything like that before. <laughs> in World War II, we have actual cargo cults in the Pacific Islands yeah. receiving yeah, where they supply do dances jobs. and rituals, wearing yeah, and rituals like an aircraft. And, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's wild. <laughs> and so it's very easy to believe that this stuff happened in the past. Um, I actually have that video. On a here. massive scale, absolutely. Let me see if I have that one, actually. This really cool video of dancing. Oh, that's about the sound weapon. Uh, no. Anyway, um, so yeah, cargo cults happened in the past. It's very likely that they could have happened in the further past in the 19th century. And, um, and so uh, what do I think happened? Well, Napoleon's army was defeated, his advanced army, definitely defeated. And his ships were, were destroyed in the sky and fell to the ground. Um, why do I know this? Uh, I don't know this. This is my assumption. It had to have happened. If you had airships, they all had to have been destroyed by something. Something shot them out of the sky. We have this interesting term, French fries. Not really sure what that came from. Um, not France, nope, you know, because they don't make they potatoes over there. It's mostly <laughs> like a, an Irish uh, thing. And, right, and you also, right. And you, also, and you also have this phobia about French fries, like we should rename them. We got to rename them. No, no, it, it's a derogatory term. Kind of like tartar French... sauce, I'm guessing. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. The tartars were, were the Eastern weirdos, you know, they, the weird tartar sauce. You know, it turned <laughs> out to be a derogatory term. So they named, you know, plaque after it, you know, tartar in your mouth and and, uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. That's just happens, uh, what happens to words, right? So French yeah. fry, I believe, I believe is direct correlation that's between a jab at them, huh? Yeah, for yeah. sure. It's that about makes how sense. They... I've always wondered that, man. I'm like, because right. yeah, you can ask any person who who uh, understands France, and they will tell you they do not serve French fry. They have chips over there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so what's Thank going you. on there? <laughs> right. Yeah, no. There's got to be a reason for it. So another word, faggot. Yeah, that's a derogatory <laughs> word, and no, nobody likes that word, but nobody knows where it came from. It basically means a flamboyant person. Uh, well, we know the French, French were definitely that. Their army was definitely that. They're very decorated and you know, pretty outfits and stuff. They're um, also, they had a beautiful language. 
and the Jesuits converted people over, indigenous people from other regions, pretty much based on their, their looks and appearances alone. You know, these small, white, beautiful looking people with a beautiful language trying to win, win over the uh, tribes. So, <clears throat> so that word faggot basically seems to have it also be connected to this um, the Napoleonic War as a result of these ships, these airships being called faggots. That's apparently what they were called. They're big wooden flotillas in the sky. The simplest term for a big wooden structure in the sky was faggot. When they went down in flames, the term faggot has achieved another um, attribute, flaming. Everyone started saying flaming faggot. And they, assu they assume that meant a person that's really, um, you know, mm -hmm. a, a flamboyant and so forth and sort of put it, putting everyone else off. Um, but actually, you know, we got this, this um, reference here in the, the Planet Wars, these airships might have gone down in flames. These faggots might have gone down in flames. And then we have a modern book, Lord of the Rings, very mm -hmm. uh, well known and, and, and mass produced that had the word faggot in it. I was actually surprised when I read that book a long time ago. It was a totally irrelevant scene. Gandalf throws a pile of, a pile of faggots into the fire. Uh, okay, why did he do that? It wasn't relevant. Go find that part in the book. You'll see there's no reason for Tolkien to put that word in that book. But him, just like Shakespeare, coined a great deal of words and reappropriated them. And in that moment, in Lord of the Rings, now faggot means a pile of sticks that you throw into a fire. When in the century before that, it clearly meant something else. So these words have a history. Right. So right anyway, on, let's, uh, <laughs> let's get back to, uh, to what could have happened. Um, Napoleon was defeated for sure. Um, we have these crazy f paintings of the event, the mud flood event, where mud fell from the, from the sky in, throughout Europe, in America, many regions, and that it was a reddish mud. It was actually the color red, usually. <clears throat> in this painting, you have, um, this is supposed to be of a comet in the 17th century. Um, again, dates are fuzzy and can easily be changed or added. Um, this event, um, which a lot of people associate with the mud flood event because it depicts a mud flood, shows the comet in the sky cr uh, crossing over and causing cataclysm. But actually, it shows two comets, doesn't it? Not just one. Right, and, right, no and doubt. Not, and they don't really look like comets, even though they have a tail. Honestly, they look a little bit like a giant laser hitting the That's outer exactly atmosphere. what I was saying. There's, and they seem to be striking something here, like or yeah. knock the top off of this uh, castle here. And Absolutely. This is a, a laser hitting the outer atmosphere of the Earth. Uh, you can see the star shape um, explosion occurring at the atmosphere level but then a precision energy is still released below it, which can target something on the ground. It sort of forms like a dreidel shape, a, a pinpoint, and it can carve out castles, mountains, the entire wow. Bering Strait, I believe, has taken out all of those Pacific islands, which today look like um, um, like empty circles. I forget the name of an island that has empty circle in the middle like of a, water. Like a K or, or a... Yeah, something like that, a bay or something. And it's... Um, and it's a type of island that cannot support life anymore because the trees can't grow in it. These islands all look to be carved out. I should just pull it up. I'm not going to do that. Yeah, um, no, no doubt. And, look, and it, it seems like, uh, you know, you've got your Grand Canyon. You've got these massive canyons in the United States, right, where there right. was obviously, uh, you know, much more going on as far as civilization than we are told, especially with right. going back into those old maps. You have Chicago known as Chilaga. These were known mm -hmm. as gold cities, right? Um, right. you, I go down here to Iowa to the state house and it's got a gold dome on the top of this massive structure. So it's not hard to imagine that these would have been everywhere. Right. <laughs> these very much would have been cities of gold to your average person. And yeah, not just uh, a myth, but right. A city of gold. Yeah, exactly. And then if there, you have an electrical device, uh, you know, or laser electrical directed energy kind of thing going on. And it's strong enough to uproot that much dirt, even if it was just one canyon, like Bryce Canyon. That's a significant amount of debris that's then put into the air, exactly. you know, and it's got to fall somewhere. And, right. uh, you know, if, if we have these rotating air currents going around the world, they're going to carry that dust everywhere. And then as soon as it rains, boom, you have an instant mud flood. You got so. it. <clears throat> so without getting too much into mud flood, um, we do have the burial mounds of uh, America. Um, these are allegedly purposeful burial mounds that the Native Americans built for themselves across the country. Smithsonian Museum has destroyed almost all of these mountains in the, in, in the 20th century. And there's only a few left. Um, the Serpent Mound, right. um, that's a famous one. But the question is, what are these mounds? Are they really 
uh, small humans buried purposefully. Now, humans don't do that. In fact, Native Americans didn't bury people at all. They incinerated people. The Bruce Ford Empire was all about incineration. Um, they knew that burial was a um, was sort of a dangerous and, and risky thing, tradition to do. You shouldn't bury people, actually. They figured this out a long time ago in Siberia, that aside from being eaten by maggots and stuff, um, you know, it's, it's not a pleasant experience and to spread disease back to the people around. They figured out in old Bruce Ford Empire a long time ago that if you're gonna if you're gonna bury somebody, they have to be important. And you got to bury them in an important place that allows for that. And that is Egypt. That's why so many tombs in Egypt. All of the czars crossed the Mediterranean, the river Styx, and were mm -hmm. entombed in Egypt in a place where the sand is so dry that their bodies, um, the fluids from their bodies dry away, no maggots. It's a nice, peaceful place to rest. Anywhere else on earth, pretty much, you don't have that kind of peace. So Native Americans in their empire knew that, did not bury people, and these burial mounds are something else. This picture shows that the idea that this was a systemic, strategic burial mound of small people buried layer after layer. But another burial mound photo shows that some of these mounds were not done with any organization at all. In fact, hmm. you see the, the person buried with their tools, and they're like, why are they buried with their tools? Oh, they bring them to the afterlife. No, that's not why. They're just buried with their tools all at once. And they're buried with their livestock as well. So how could that be? There wouldn't have been a ceremony. It wouldn't have been a death ceremony. This would have been all at once. They, they immediately got buried all at once in a single event and got covered and, and stuck in this sort of pattern. Right. Later on, later on, they were finding all these burial mounds and digging them up. The Smithsonian Museum really, really, it looks like they covered all this up. So there's no reason for anyone to be trusting them that they found the, the mounds intact like this photo shows because they destroyed them all. You know, they're the culprits who destroyed them. You see right, the photos, yeah. there's, see there's a bunch of black slaves you're working anyway. And then supposedly so, reappropriated all of the remains back to uh, the Native American groups. Right. which doesn't make sense when you speak to a native american they will tell you about this war with these giant people that apparently built these mounds and uh, them having it out for hundreds of years so <laughs> why would we give the the remains back to this other culture of their enemy That's a great point. you That's know a great point. so it's it's kind of mind-blowing right so um <clears throat> like i said the book of mormon actually says also that there were giants here in america and that they're all wiped out by god so why don't we just look at that testimony as um as real, not to say that the Mormons are crazy anymore. Maybe they're, <laughs> right. maybe they've been, they've, they've been, been onto redacted. a lot, man. <laughs> yeah. They've been redacted into the deep state religion. Everything's like a fairy tale now. And their text has been changed. No doubt about it, but their book of Mormon represents the least redacted version of the Bible, the most recent version that we have. And in that version, there was, Amer there was giants in America that came from the collinear configuration, the tower of Babel before it fell and settled in America. And um, when they're all wiped out, um, the, the Mormon Book of Mormon says that the survivors, Native American survivors, their skin was red from this event. What kind of event would turn their skin red? Only the kind of event that would, would be involving heat, right? Tremendous heat from the sky hitting everyone all at once. Do we have any references for this kind of event happening aside from mud flood? Yes, we do. Tunguska event of 1800, sorry, 1908 or 1912, depending which one you believe. Tunguska very uh, interesting um, testimony. This event wiped out Siberia. It destroyed entire forests, and the people who um, survived it said that they felt their skin burning all, all at once. The sky rips open, splits in half. One side of it turns red. They feel their skin burning, and they start to try to rip their clothes off, look for water, try to jump into there to save themselves. For some reason, nobody died in the Tunguska event, even though they said it was a 12 megaton explosion and so forth. Um, it's probably because the Tunguska event is a redaction. So the date was changed. It occurred originally in 1812, and they said it happened in 1912. And as a result of that, we have zero deaths, and, and all of the deaths were pushed into the past, into the Napoleonic Wars. So um, <clears throat> what kind of, so how did this happen? How did this um, mud flood event happen? How was Napoleon defeated? Like I said, um, there's humans on Mars. They've been influencing our, event, our affairs since the golden age, they've always been involved. They, they speak through the cathedrals and the pyramids. Um, they have very limited influence here because for a long time, they weren't able to travel. They, they only are a couple hundred years ahead of us in technology as a result of being dependent on technology. They have poor resources on Mars, seasonal water and so forth. So um, yes, uh, this whole time, they've been trying to get resources from earth and that requires controlling earth in some fashion. 
And when the Napole Napoleonic Wars ruined their plan, they had to do something so drastic to reverse the plan and bring it back to where it is today. And so what I believe they did was they um, created a giant um, space laser. And uh, why do I believe that? Because we have a lot of predictive programming that basically implies exactly that. Um, everything from the Simpsons to, uh, you know, um, I was like the guy's name. Um, I'm forgetting the early literature now. Simpsons, let's stick to that one. Have you seen this episode? Uh, it's a Halloween special where um, where uh, there's this giant laser that that's built and humanity has been enslaved. You ever saw this yeah. episode? <laughs> right. yeah. Very funny, right? It's because uh, Kang runs for president and they have to vote for him because it's a two-party system and all that. Anyway, they've been giving us this predictive programming in in all forms of media, in books, movies, TV, to make us to get the idea through our head so that we reject it. Why are we rejecting yeah, it? Because exactly. we believe that we believe it's fiction. We yeah, know that Simpsons is fiction. It's it's a Hollywood episode, for God's sake, you know. So here on. we got yeah. here we got like a Mega Man um, comic book, which is talking about not only the, the mythical content continent of Moo, but also the end of the world. Like, why are they bringing these topics up in, in kids' literature? I played all the Mega Man games, and they have nothing. To right. Do with that. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Here's here's a South Park, and they're they're um you know how they are, they attack everything so. They went after the Mormons and said, "This is what they really believe." Can you believe they believe this? Yeah, and then it, it's all dumb, 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 dumb. So yeah, you got yeah. So, but, but hey, they're saying, "Look at this." You know, the Native Americans were white; they weren't redskins originally, and uh, you know, they had this whole advanced empire here in America. They weren't. Yeah, they tell the story, but they make it sound like it's so out there to even possibly believe that you'd have to be stupid, you know? And that's exactly. and, and they pull it off. They do. That's right. They're not even showing anything. They're just, they're just make us hear it. Imagine it. So yeah, predictive <laughs> programming is a, is a big clue for what they don't want us to believe in or look at. Um, but like I said, the, the American civilization, like you point out, cities of gold, advanced technology, um, they still have a lot of the churches today still sticking around. They're all built in this Tatarian architecture, which is right. known today as Roman architecture, but people are starting to use the word Tatarian because that's really what it is. Um, <clears throat> these structures exist throughout Europe and in Asia and in America. And um, very few of them actually exist in Italy. They, they have, like I said, Rome and, and Florence, but right. um, that was not the center. So uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so what could have caused the um, Grand Canyon? The Electric Universe guys point to this primor primary cor cor coronal storm system. This is how electricity discharges in a planet. First, the planet absorbs a lot of electricity from, say, another planet in a configuration or something. And then it, it, that energy has to go somewhere. It can't be destroyed or dissipated um, due to laws of physics. So sorry, laws of um, thermodynamics, rather. Right. Um, that energy has to go somewhere. So it comes out as a secondary discharge. And that secondary discharge comes out from the ground, from inside the planet. Energy passing through the inside of the planet, it's hollow, and then back out through the surface. Um, <clears throat> it hit these regions because these regions were, um, were, were dry. And, um, and the, the, and the, uh, the sand and the rock was able to get charged up quickly. It wasn't swampy. It didn't have forests or anything like that. So these regions got hit by the secondary electric discharge. And they think it happened in primordial times. And I think it happened in the 1812 war, essentially, because it matches up right. perfectly with, with the topo topography that we see in these regions. They're all pretty much electric scarred. So yeah, that's where we're getting at. Um, I got a bunch of predictive programming st stuff on here. That Ghostbusters mentions the Tunguska event in 18, 1908. And also in uh, Ghostbusters 2, they mention the end of the world apocalyptic date being February 14th, 2016. They predicted <laughs> in the future. And he said, Valentine's Day, bummer. Um, this wasn't a joke. These guys know what the next apocalypse date is because they know what the last one is. Yeah, well, and you know, based on the uh, Ethiopian calendar, which apparently is still, uh, still intact, um, you know, after the it's not the same as the uh, gregorian or the julian calendar nice. I didn't hear that. I got and you um so apparently the year we're in today <laughs> this year is 2016 uh a couple of years ago would have been 2014 or no is it 2014 now it's right around 2014 or 2016 right now so um you might want to look into that it's very interesting to That's find interesting out that too. they that they do still have an old calendar intact and they were talking about when uh, you know, this last uh, scamdemic hit 
that it was actually the beginning of the year or the end of the year 2012 by the Ethiopian calendar. So mm-hmm. that much being said, that's that's interesting. So we're going through it right now, and what yeah, this that, uh, particular really shift is is and, is yet quite a, to be seen. <laughs> right, and I've noticed about a four year and eight year shift in a couple of dates anyway. So I, I see that this has been going for a while. And I'm a programmer, <laughs> so uh, everything I think about with numbers or anything like that. I try to think of it in programming terms, causality. And uh, I'm trying to look at history in that terms. And to me, it makes perfect sense for them to, to constantly shift the date like that. And a perfect example of that is the, is the London fire of 1666, which occurred on September 6th. And, and on this date, you basically have the entire city of London burn and changed their government and they imposed a usury and so forth afterwards. But <clears throat> before that date, it was predicted as an apocalypse date. By, by many people, not just uh, Christians in the West, but also by rabbis in the East. And um, while, no, while nothing happened in the East and the rabbis converted to, to Islam, according to Salgerian history, in the West, the city of London burned on that date. And the most interesting thing about that date is if you plug in the phantom time hypothesis to it, the real date was the year 666 on September You're Right. <laughs> so, so, you know, now you got an actual reference for them predicting in dates based on this number and then something happens and that kind of event will convince people wow maybe god really does influence us or something like that so yes i do see a lot of evidence of date shifting the power of date shifting there absolutely man that's that's wild so do you do you think that that uh at, at some point along that energy like meridian that they introduced a significant charge or that this came from like off planet um it definitely has there? to have has to have been from off planet because like I said, it wasn't an advanced technology age. It was, it was the, um, the dawn of technology, advanced technology. Everything that was being built was done in a simple fashion. A lot of things were nuclear powered because nuclear um, fuel was easy to generate into electricity. Also people knew that nuclear fuel was safe and healthy. Actually, it's good for you. There's no reason to ban it. There's no reason for microchips. There's no reason for wires. All the technology was simple. So when it comes to, um, building a, a laser capable of destroying regions on another planet. They didn't have satellites yet. They didn't have, um, you know, remote, you know, control or right. anything like that. They had to do it themselves with their own hands, the biggest scale they could possibly do. And the way that this works is that we're not as far from Mars as we think we are. Um, during opposition, we're at the closest um, juncture to Mars. Uh, this happens every 36 months, actually. And that it, the 36 month period, correlates with a lot of weird activity on Earth. Um, the, the stock market, for example, always jumps when we're in opposition with Mars, always, uh, as if they're trading on Earth, which they most likely are. Um, but most importantly, during the opposition, the electromagnetic fields of both planets bump up against each other. And that means that you can pass energy between them. So you're not shooting across the, the, the space. You're shooting between touching fields. It's right. very, um, it's very uh, there's nowhere else for the energy to go. The energy is going to flow to the Earth. It's going to strike the ground. It's just a matter of positive and negative. So all, all they had to do was build one of those devices of the giant, of the biggest, largest scale that they possibly could do. Um, there was, the, the reason why I believe that they did this in anticipation of the Napoleonic Wars is because of the Napoleon Comet, which was seen in 1811. You can see, you can look it up. And this mm-hmm. comet was, was seen during the wars and everyone said it was a harbinger of his defeat. But other people say that Napoleonic Comet was what defeated Napoleon. This comet showed up and defeated him, just destroyed his entire army. And they say the exact same thing about this chief in America. This this comet is named after him too, but in America. And they say that it wiped out his entire American tribe. So you can look up the comets and, and they happened in 1811. Right, right. And so it says right up against that war right there. So I, I think that they had the gun ready. They, they saw this stuff happening on earth and they basically didn't want to use it until they absolutely had to. And they knew that this could fall apart on them because they're the ones that create it. They know how fragile this deep state religion is, this monotheism. Honestly, one of these days, we're going to snap out of it. A whole planet is going to snap out of it because it's just not, it's not who we are. It's not who we were. It doesn't represent our religions very well or our regions. Like it doesn't represent Christianity or Judaism or Islam or any of those things have nothing to do with monotheism, period. And eventually we're going to disconnect that one belief. And when we do that, we're going to have dislodged ourselves from control of the deep state as it exists. And until we do that, we'll never really fully be in charge, uh, uh, free of them. Because as long as we still believe that, you know, it's time to go to church and listen to what, you know, the priest says God is saying, 
then they will always be able to speak for God and they will always be able to create pandemics and warfare and force everyone to just go pray it and hope for good luck, essentially. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. No it's doubt. Been their scheme this whole time. No doubt for sure. Um, man. And you know, that's, that's one thing that I think most people can agree on is the manipulation factor of the religious complex. And, and it doesn't matter what, you know, your particular faith is. Uh, no. If you are engaging with these systems, you know, you're the one losing out and it doesn't matter if it's, I mean, the financial system, if it's the religious system, if it's the educational system, if you're engaging with these systems that are all built by the same group of people, um, you're going to lose. It doesn't matter. Maybe you get a degree out of it though, right? You know, maybe you get, um, you get a, a white collar to slip under your, your black shirt, you know, you get these little perks, these very material perks out of something yeah. that's supposed to be more divinely centered, like, you know, they, they'll, uh, yeah, it's they'll mind never, blowing. What they'll never give you is a path into their system. You'll never become a celebrity, a movie star, a politician, a preacher, not a, one that matters, you know, right, the, right. The, the Unless you preacher. buy in. Yeah. Those guys are all nepotistic. They're families. You have to be part of their family and that families never betray themselves. That's why I believe the deep state is a natural human thing. It's just families that, that would rather see everyone else go down so, so that they don't have to face the crimes that they have, their family has done in the past. It's a very innocent concept. And the, the people while, while doing continuing it, to engage in criminal activity. And, and right. so it they don't see themselves this... as criminals at all. You know, no, I know no, how families sure. like this operate because I have an Israeli family and they are all about protecting the tribe, you know? Right. And truth and suppressed technology and money, all those things. They believe that they can claim those things that don't belong to anyone else but them. So it's kind of hard to deal with, you know, mentality sure. like that. Yeah, it's 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 hard, and it's hard to have hope and and aspirations uh, for the future when when your world is run by absolute maniacs. Kind of yeah. like uh, uh, Charlton Heston said, "Those maniacs, they blew it all up. They blew it all to hell." Right. Yeah. <laughs> so they have told us exactly what has gone on uh, through so many different avenues that it's just confusing. You know, um, but what you can count on is that one avenue that you're so used to tuning into is not the real shit. <laughs> you right. know, you're not finding anything worthwhile by watching CNN or no. or anywhere on TV. And most often you're not going to find anything worthwhile in historic text type format. You're, you're just not I agree. anything no that's causality. been translated into English or is of English Latin. origin has no no past to it it has you know what i mean it, it's lost in translation all of it and it's on purpose you nice. know all of this language division is on purpose um that way none of us can understand each other enough uh through our disillusion in in different religion you know uh being uh you know divisively uh Div uh, div uh, divided <laughs> there we go right um you know none of us will take the time and, and it starts with like a simple conversation like you and i are having but it comes you got to have an open mind and, and we're not taught to have open minds about anything right now except for apparently gender role i think that's the only thing we're supposed to have an open mind about is what somebody's gender identity is other yeah. than that we need to stick to our own guns, uh, apparently, and hold it, hold it down for our religion or our subsect of the, the man's cause. So, you know, yeah, hopefully uh, there's more people out there kind of coming to and, and waking up and deciding to take their lives back for themselves and, you know, quit doing the, the self-destructive behavior that Hollywood preaches. <laughs> you know oh, it's happening. I mean? yeah, yeah, it's happening. For sure. I, I like to think so. And it definitely seems to um in you know, my immediate kind of sphere of influence so i'm i'm thankful for that and dude i'm so thankful for you coming on man and breaking it down for us all yeah and there's man there's so much there it's so much fun to talk about all of it but this it does is. it does to a certain degree get uh can be kind of frightening for people and make you not want to open your eyes when you see that there's a string being pulled that possibly changed the face of the earth a couple of hundred years ago you know, right. that's a, a pretty daunting thing to want to stand up against. And, um, you know, so I appreciate you being out there and getting that info out and and for coming on, man. It's It's been Absolutely. an amazing ride. Thank you so much. It's been much. a lot of fun. Yeah, it's been Absolutely, a lot of fun. dude. Have Thanks, a good man. one. We'll see you next time.